session, the Honorable Cheryl Lee Matthews for training. Good morning, you may be seated. James Crumbly, case number 222799-989FH. Calling people versus Jennifer Crumbly, case number 222799-990FH. Good morning. Good morning. Our case on behalf of people. Karen McDonald on behalf of people. Good morning, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman on behalf of James Crumbly, who is seated to my right. And good morning, Your Honor. I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly. Good morning. Um, maybe see it. I, I want to tell you that I became ill last Friday and I've been taking medication for the last five days. I feel fine. My doctor says I'm no longer contagious, but I have a lingering cough that is sure to annoy everyone in this room. Uh, I determined my cough would not be as annoying as adjourning the sentence, um, so you have my apologies, all right? I know this is an emotional day for everyone, and I want to say that I have, uh, I, I want to ask first, uh, Mr. Crumley, can you hear? I can. Thank okay, you, uh, all right, I want to make sure. Um, the court has reviewed the pre-sentence investigation with regard to each defendant and the sentencing memos provided. With regard to, to defendant uh, Mrs. Crumley, have the prosecutor, Ms. Smith, and defendant Mrs. Crumley had the opportunity to read and discuss the pre-sentence report? I have had the opportunity to discuss it with my client, and we do have uh, a few objections. Okay. You're, you're There's getting, one correction. You're getting ahead of me. Sorry. All right. It's, it's uh, a little unwieldy with um, everyone here, but I just want to make sure that you went over the pre-sentence report. The prosecutor has had that opportunity as well. Correct? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. And with regard to defendant Mr. Crumley, have the prosecutor, Ms. Lehman, and the defendant, Mr. Crumley, had the opportunity to read and discuss the pre-sentence report? Good morning, Your Honor. I have had the opportunity to review the pre-sentence investigation with Mr. Crumley. All right. And then with regard to uh, defendant Mrs. Crumley, um, do you have any corrections, deletions, or additions, um, both the prosecutor as well as defense counsel? But you, you may go ahead. Thank you. Um, the only correction we would have, Your Honor, is that actually on the very front face sheet, it indicates that uh, Ethan Crumbly is a co-defendant, and I would ask that he be uh, taken off in that regard. Well, he's not... Um, I, I think probation has um, addressed, I've discussed this with probation. Um, Ms. Wheeler, um, what is your suggestion with regard to the pre-sentence investigation? He, he clearly is not a co-defendant. That's correct. And in the PSI, he's listed as a related defendant, which is the best um, phrase we could come up with. But I'm comfortable if we want to move that to a condition 9.01. Okay. Um, and then it wouldn't list him as a co-defendant, but it was still um, request the no contact order. Okay. Are, are you each satisfied with that? He's a related defendant, correct? I'm satisfied with that, but I would ask the court to hear our objection as to the no contact provision later. Um, sure. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, no other corrections, deletions, or additions, correct? Correct. All right. Not for Mrs. Crumley. Thank you. All right. Um, prosecutor, with regard to the pre-sentence investigation, with regard to Jennifer Crumley, are there any, are there any corrections, deletions, or additions to the pre-sentence investigation? No, yes, thank you. All right. Um, and with regard to Mr. Crumley, are there any corrections, deletions, or additions to the pre-sentence investigation? Yes, Your Honor, there are some corrections. Again, on the cover sheet, it does, the cover sheet of the PSI report does indicate that Mr. Crumley's son is a co-defendant. I understand that that's going to be changed. Um, Correct. We're satisfied with that. Also, on page one um, of the pre-sentence investigation report, there's an indication that Mr. Crumley has a substance abuse history. Um, he indicated during the pre-sentence investigation that he, he, has used substances, alcohol, marijuana, but they, not a substance abuse history. So we would ask that um, the PSI report reflects that Mr. Crumley does not have a substance abuse history. It's just simply a box checked yes, Your Honor. Well, I guess I'm going to ask probation to um, indicate uh, why they checked that box. But from what I read, he indicated that he used marijuana daily. And I didn't read that there was any medical purpose. Um, there's also some su uh, support for large volumes of, of, of vodka and whiskey being purchased in a one month period, so. Your Honor, I am so sorry if I may. Um, I did not realize it says yes, 
in the box for Mrs. Crumbly with regard to alcohol use. I didn't know we were gonna get into the substance, but those purchases were all made in November, right before Thanksgiving, right before the Crumblies hosted extended family and people for the holidays. So to use those receipts that the prosecution attached in their memo that were not even part of trial um, it is unfair. And my client also denies having an alcohol abuse history. Well, they were part of tr the trial because I excluded them. Right. right. No, no, no. Well, the alcohol purchases, I, you had excluded the photographs with the, with the alcohol bottles. I believe two years ago, there was a request by the prosecution to introduce evidence that the Crumleys had made large volumes of purchases at a liquor store close to their home. Um, and I don't think at the time the prosecutor was able to link those party store purchases um, to alcohol. So at that time, two years ago, um, I, I believe I excluded that at that time. But I'm going to allow uh, the prosecution as, as well as probation uh, to address that. Just on the last comment from the court judge, that's correct. I think it was June of 2022. And regarding the, the purchases themselves, Council put in photographs of that Thanksgiving dinner. There were six people there. The evidence supported by the prosecution shows 18 different bottles of whiskey and vodka over a 26-day period. Just it's it's factual by the of the evidence that occurred. I believe probation can better articulate the reason why the box substance abuse was checked, but it appears just from the the factual information that's why it was checked yesterday. Um, Ms. Wheeler, would you like to address uh, that? Um, Judge, I agree with Mr. Keese. The alcohol purchases were not put into the PSI because we were not aware of those at the time the PSI was prepared. Um, I believe with Mr. Crumley, he reported daily marijuana use without the, um, without the use of a alcohol marijuana card. Um, and in addition, and Mrs. Crumley's use is outlined in the narrative, and I think that that justifies uh, substance abuse experience. Your Honor, I would object to <coughs> substance abuse. Any substance abuse was in high school, and there certainly is not drug abuse. So she's listed as yes for drug abuse, yes for alcohol abuse, and yes for substance abuse. We would be objecting to all three, but there's the probation department hasn't even said anything with respect to Mrs. Crumbly and drug abuse. Um, would you agree that drug use should be stricken? Judge, it says that uh, she first tried marijuana at the age of 16 and alcohol at 19, used marijuana occasionally until 2020. Okay, um, well, occasionally. I don't, does it sound like drug, drug abuse? Sure, Judge. I mean, for some people, I guess. So I'm going to struck, strike drug abuse as it relates to Mrs. Crumley, um, but uh, keep substance abuse and alcohol abuse as to, as to both um, in the pre-sentence investigation. All right. So what else? Um, yes, Your Honor. Also, and this is a little nitpicky, Your Honor, but on pages two and three of the basic information report, it lists the sentencing date as April 9th, 2024 at 12 a.m., obviously. Um, the court is not open at 12 a.m. We would just ask for the Well, I would tonight. be if I could. <laughs> I know you would, Your Honor. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So that, um, that's a computer issue, yeah. right? I don't sure. actually think we can correct that at this point. Okay. It's a computer program. Sure. Um, Your Honor, in Mr. Crumbly's criminal history, each offense lists an arrest date. Mr. Crumbly maintains that he has been arrested twice, including for the instant offenses. Specifically, record seven of eight of Mr. Crumbly's criminal history in the um, pre sentence investigation report indicates that Mr. Crumley was arrested on August 29th of 2017 by the Oakland County Sheriff's Office for failing to display a valid license. Um, I did review the 523 <coughs> District Court Register of Actions online, um, and in fact, it indicates that the citation was dismissed on August 29th of 2017, that the citation was issued on August 9th of 2017. So I would ask that the record 7 of 8 correct that Mr. Crumley was arrested on August 29th of 2017. That's not accurate. Okay. So I don't have an objection to striking that, um, but we do often put in district court arraignment dates under arrest date. Okay. That helps us when we score PRV 6 going forward status at 10 events. But I don't have an objection to keeping that. All right, so the arrest date, um, Ms. Lehman, is August 9th, 2017. That's what you want. When the citation was issued, Your Honor, okay. correct. All right. um, as it relates to substance use, Your Honor, and I, I should have said this a few minutes ago, in the PSI report, it indicates that Mr. Crumbly was using alcohol and marijuana from 1997 to go. In the PSI report, it indicates that Mr. Crumbly was using alcohol and marijuana from 1997 to 2021, but that's not accurate. Um, during the pre-sentence interview, Mr. Crumbly was asked when he first used 
of Palm Airline. And he indicated okay. it was 1997. So I would just ask for a correction that it wasn't used that whole time, um, that it was a first use, and that it was. Um, and then Mr. Crumbly uh, first used marijuana at 21, then not again until it became legal in Michigan. I believe is what the indication was during the pre sentence investigation. Ms. Wheeler, I believe you told me that he was experiencing daily use at the time of the offense. That's correct. Correct, until the fall of 2021. It's a bit hard to explain that in the chart because it only asks for a start date and end date, but I can try to explain that a little better in the narrative. All right, I appreciate that. We really appreciate that. Thank you, Your Honor. And the last one, on pages 33 and 34, um, there were statements alleged to have been made by Mr. Crumley to a therapist on March 18th of 2024. I did speak with Mr. Crumley regarding those alleged statements <coughs> that were included in the pre-sentence investigation report, and he denies making the statements that he was experiencing sadness, depression, anxiety attacks, or any of the symptoms listed in the report. Um, the interview was conducted by video. Your Honor, it was a, a video call, so there was significant difficulty in communicating, but I would ask that those statements be stricken as Mr. Crumley indicates that they were not so. I have no further questions after that, Ms. Wheeler, any comment on that? George, they are in the mental health records. I could put in a statement that um, Mr. Crumbly disputes this in the narrative and then explain that there were issues <coughs> in communication during the video visit. Are you satisfied with that? I'm, I'm sorry, Your Honor? Are you satisfied with Ms. Wheeler's question? I, I didn't hear the whole thing. <coughs> sorry, Mr. Crumbly gets to be questioned. Probably because I was calling. Uh, they are in the mental health records, but I could put a statement in there that Mr. Crumbly disputes this at the time of sentencing and then put in the explanation. That would be great. Thank you. Prosecutor, any comment? Okay. All right. So there are no other corrections, conditions, or objections. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. There are a number of objections. I believe uh, Ms. Smith also has some, but corrections, additions, deletions, I believe. All right. Um, I want to um, point out that each defendant has a right to and will receive an individualized sentencing in this matter. Um, I want to confirm, because the victim's um, impacted are the same, the court felt it would be uh, in the best interest of the victim's defendants and also judicially efficient to hear all of the victim impact statements at the same time. Um, I want to be sure that neither defendant has any objection to that. No, Your Honor, that's fine. Thank you. No objection, Your Honor. All right. Um, what else about the pre-sentence investigation? Would you like to go first, Your Honor? Um, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, Your Honor, we would object to the narrative summary as written by probation and also the agent's description of offense. It's very obvious that probation did not sit through trial and hear all of the evidence that came out at trial. For sure. There is a number of mistakes, and it is so biased that I just would I would just make sure that ask the court to ask them to. Um, there are so many mistakes. I mean, I could be on the record for ten minutes going on with them, but the narrative is just not accurate. So I would ask the court to keep that in mind and make a note of that. Is the information gleaned from the police report? That's how a pre-sentence investigation is normally done. I don't think anyone here, to my knowledge, has a copy of the transcript of either trial. My understanding is ordering that is about $35,000. Yeah. I don't think anyone, the probation, of course, has not seen a trial transcript and in any sentencing they haven't seen a trial transcript. I do agree with you that the agent's description of offense is from the police reports and documents along those lines. However, the narrative summary of what was proven at trial identifying five things against Mrs. Crumbly is simply inaccurate. That those five things are pointed out in my memo. I explain each of those. If the court does not need me to make a record, I won't. But if the court does, well, that, that's up to you. I, it's in the record in terms of the sentencing memo. Okay. I'll I'll just give like one example. They're saying that as the fifth reason, um, she should be considered to have committed illegal acts is because she was. Of the right words. She was rarely home. That in itself is not a crime. That in itself is not illegal. The, the information put in that report is not accurate. It I agree with you. The same could be said about me. Same me. Me too. Me too. Okay. So I agree with you. But I, I guess I guess where we're getting our wires crossed here is that. Ms. Wheeler, and in every um, pre-sentence investigation, probation uh, takes information from the police report. 
Like Ms. Wheeler didn't make it up herself, but she of course did not have the benefit of the trial transcript either. Also, the trial transcript does not um, include all the information ever uh, by necessity of the rules of evidence, right? I understand. The only reason I bring it to the court's attention and make the objection is because this is a document that will follow Mrs. Crumbly, and it's important that it's accurate. That's so. I just want to make the objection to the record. All right. All right. What else? What, what else um, can you miss? Um. Did you want me to go into the objections on the scoring and the objection on the no contact order, or would you like to first? I agree that Sister has a similar argument regarding the narrative summary and agent's description in her PSI as well. As well. Would you like to address that before the sentencing guidelines? Or? I can, Your Honor, if you like. I did, again, um, I did submit the sentencing memorandum, which does more fully outline what my objections are. However, Your Honor, in reviewing the, um, the over 14 page narrative that was provided to the court in the PSI report, it's obvious that that was, it, it at least appears to myself, Your Honor, that that narrative was mostly written after Jennifer Crumley's trial. Um, it was not written after James Crumley's trial. It contains mostly information um, regarding, or uh, information uh, found in the police reports, in, in various witness statements, and information from the prosecutor's office, it appears. And I'm objecting to it because it is not specific to Mr. Crumley. It's not accurate. It contains information that was not admitted to trial. It contains information that was not evidenced during Mr. Crumley's trial and shouldn't be held against him for the purposes of sentencing. Well, I, I guess I agree with you. Um, Ms. Wheeler is always very thorough. And um, I'm not surprised if there's a 14-page narrative. Uh, that information is taken from the police report. I, um, I'm aware of that. Or I believe that... The Department of Corrections always does it in that way. I don't think that there's anyone here, I could be wrong, who's read a trial transcript. I, I don't know, maybe someone has excerpts of it, but the, the trial transcript will take a very long time. Um, the the pre-sentence investigation is never based on the trial transcript. So I, I suppose it would be appropriate uh, to include in the pre-sentence investigation that the narrative of the pre-sentence investigation is based on the police reports submitted in this manner, which are numerous, correct, from many different agencies. That's correct, right? Is there any and objection to that? No, but just, just one comment, as far as the PSI. This court indicated every single PSI utilizes the police report and other information to compile the narrative information. Correct. The, the court sat to the trial. The court can make the corporate record when the sentence was handed down. The jury found these facts to be true. I dispute the characterization that the, the PSI is real with inaccuracy. I believe it to be accurate. And this reader obviously reviewed all the cell phone records, and those were included. Judge, you made certain rulings throughout the pendency of this trial, as you alluded to earlier. You have all the information. It's, it's readily available to you. Nothing needs to be extracted from the summary. I have no objection to a statement in the PSI indicating that this reader drew information from the near or police reports. That's fine. Like I said, it happens in every single case. But I do dispute the characterization. But I understand the court is going to issue the sentencing individual to the offense of the offender based upon the record. Correct. Right. Right. So we'll add that. We'll add that. Thank you, Your Honor. It does, in the report, it does indicate um, a number of reports that Ms. Wheeler relied on in writing the narrative. And then it says, and other evidence. Um, and again, some of the things that are listed in the narrative were not evidence in James Crumley's trial, specifically the over 2,000 pages of text messages or messages between Mr. and Mrs. Crumley, in addition to other messages between Mrs. Crumley and her son and things of that nature. So I'm asking for those corrections. We could use a different word. We could use a different word. And Judge, again, as the court has stated, it's the same police reports that are used for each. Um, and I do believe it's very clear in the CSI that they are conversations between Mrs. Crumley and someone else. It certainly doesn't say Mrs. Crumley. That's correct, Your Honor. I'm just ensuring that Mr. Crumley's PSI is specific to Mr. Crumley I and that the court is considering that. That's why I'm asking for making the objection to Your Honor. All right. I appreciate that. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. What else? Any, anything else about uh, the recent investigation? Um, Besides the sentencing guidelines, right? Aside from the sentencing guidelines, the other objection relates to the no contact provision proposed between Mrs. Crumbly and Mr. Crumbly. 
and I'm arguing on behalf of Mrs. Crumbly, obviously, and between Mrs. Crumbly and Ethan Crumbly. This is a family. They have, a, despite even having felonies on their records, they have a constitutional right to be a family unless the prosecution can articulate a reason that is valid and surpasses a certain standard to allow, to disrupt the family from being able to have contact with one another. Um, let me give you some information that I, I didn't previous, previously have. I consulted with the probation department, the Michigan Department of Corrections. They have indicated to me that um, if Mr. Crumley and the shooter are in prison, uh, the Michigan Department of Corrections will categorize them as enemies. Um, and I put that in quotes. The reason being that they will not, it'd be like two brothers or, or something like that, they will not, they're characterized in that way, so they will not be housed in the same facility. Um, so there is that factor. I, I think um, the other difficulty um, I'm having is that um, I got your pre, uh, your sentencing memo at about 4.32 on Friday, and the same as I, I got over the weekend. So the prosecutor didn't have a chance to respond to that. So I'm, I'm not clear if, if there's, I guess I'm going to ask if there's any objection or if there was, if you'd like to file, uh, file something supplementally. I, I honestly never faced this issue. So I, I don't know. I can just, my only response to is that we're asking that these defendants be treated like any other defendant okay. in the Michigan Department of Corrections. Right. And it's my information that because they are co-defendants, the no contact will be in place, and because the, the shooter is a related defendant, no contact will be in place. Again, I Okay, you just mentioned two different issues. Because they're co-defendants, they're, they're a man and a woman anyway, right? right. So they would, if, if they go to the Michigan Department of Corrections, they would not be in the same facility. Correct. Um, co-defendants are, are traditionally not housed together. There's that issue. She's asking about a no contact order between Mr. and Mrs. and the shooter. So I, I don't know what your position is on that, or if you have any legal ability to support your position, if you want to respond to it later. I have frankly never um, faced this issue, so. Well, yeah, that's probably true, Judge. And, and as the court indicated, this, this was uh, objection to me recently. I don't have anything at the ready as far as legal authority regarding that. My information is only from the Michigan Department of Corrections, and the reason why they put the no contact <coughs> in place, and that is because of the nature of this crime and the fact that they are related to crime. Again, we're not asking for any special treatment one way or the other. We just want whatever the Michigan Department of Corrections can do in any other case. All right, well, would you like to respond to this, Wheeler? I think you are the one who told me about the enemy status and in quotes that would be <coughs> Yes, Judge, there's certainly no guidebook for this situation again. Um, those are I'm my sure thoughts on why I recommended um, the no contact order, but certainly the court can issue what they want. It was just my thoughts. Do you, do you, um, would you like to um, respond? If not, I don't see a reason to have a no contact order um, at the moment. If, if the Michigan Department of Corrections was able to tell me the reason to have a no contact order, I, I, I know you haven't had a chance to respond, but I, at the moment, I can think of a reason for a no contact order. If, if there if the three of them are all in the Michigan Department of Corrections, it would then be up to the Michigan Department of Corrections. But should I be ordering that right now? Just what I'm asking. Is there legal authority for me to do it? The options are lifting the no contact order or allowing you to research further. You just don't want the sentence to be judged. Maybe. I'm not hearing the sentence. In that case, Judge, could the court hold this in advance so we can resist? Yes. That would be yes. That would be my preference. All right, thank you. I'm going to do that. All right. Does anyone have a chance to respond to that? Just, just the issue of whether or not the three of them would have no contact via, I, I, I think you're, if, if, all, if all three of them were in the Michigan Department of Corrections or if one of them was somewhere else at, at some given time, is there a, a to be contact either by letter or phone? or visit, that's what you're asking about. Yes, that's what okay. we're asking about. Right. But 
the obviously if Michigan Department of Corrections is overseeing or if they're in a facility, there's rules they have to follow and this court doesn't order all of the rules that have to be followed. Oh, I, I agree. So, That's up to Michigan Department of Corrections. So yeah. the court um, obviously will get the prosecution time to file a supplemental response. We filed our response rather quickly because we were given the PSI last week. We were given the prosecutor's motion, uh, memo on Wednesday. And I mean, obviously, we got it. I got it on Friday, Friday, but there wasn't much time. I would also like an opportunity to either respond to their argument or to be able to brief the issue uh, first if the court would like because it's my objection more fully than I have been able to in here. You may. You may. Okay. It's not something I've uh, dealt with. I guess I'm just asking what time frame the court would like or how, how long would the prosecution like to respond? A week's time. Okay, so you are going to um, file something by April 16th and then I'm how long would you like until the 23rd of April to respond? That would be great, thank you. I mean, they, they might do some research and find out there's no, there's no basis for it. I, I, I don't know. And Judge, I will look further into that and also provide the information. All right, thank you. Thank you. So don't communicate with the court, defense counsel. Thank you. Just for the record, I'm just placing my objection to the no contact order for the reasons stated in my sentencing memorandum. I will also file a reply for you on it. All right, thank you. All right, what else? Your Honor, the um, remainder of the objections for Mrs. Crumley are based on guidelines scoring. Right. Sure. Would the court like me to? Sure. Okay. Um, Your Honor, Mrs. Crumbly is objecting to the scoring of offense variables 7, 9, and 13, all based largely on the same reasoning. And so those offense variables are scored the way they are proposed by the Michigan Department of Corrections based on the number of deaths that resulted and based on the number of um, the number of uh, persons injured. And the problem with it is that Mrs. Crumbly was found guilty of completing an act of gross negligence or failing to adhere to a legal duty. But when the shooter got the gun and made the decision to shoot multiple people, that took any and all culpability for the number of victims and put it in his hands. So the shooter, if he had gone out and shot one person, which, if it's reasonably foreseeable he would hurt anyone, okay, one person might be reasonably foreseeable, the guidelines would be scored far differently. And, and just as a matter of course, the guidelines don't take into account a situation like this, much like much of the law in this case has been novel and new. So we would ask the court to score those guidelines at zero points because... Can you be specific about which you need to take each guideline individually? It's sure. important for the record. Right? Sure. Okay, so prior record variable seven gets scored when there are two or more offenses that the defendant is convicted on. And the objection in this case is that the conviction is based on there being four deaths. There, the conviction is not based on Mrs. Crumley committing four acts of gross negligence. And this is a case where we have an intervening factor. We have an adult who was charged as an adult, <coughs> sentenced as an adult to life without parole, who took everything out of Mrs. Crumbly's hands and made decisions himself. So to charge Mrs. Crumbly, hold it against her that there are four deaths, she, that is not, that part of it was not reasonably foreseeable to Mrs. Crumbly. Did the jury disagree with that? No, the jury found that there was, the jury did not find four different ways to say that there was gross negligence. The, the scoring is based on the number of deaths. At the end of the day, the shooter could have gone and shot one person, or four people, or a hundred people. The problem is, is that even if it's foreseeable that something was going to happen, when the shooter intervened and made the decision what he was going to do as an adult 
that was convicted and held accountable for each of those four deaths and everyone injured, it came out of control from Mrs. Crumbly. So we object to the scoring that she committed um, four offenses. I, I agree with you, the jury entered four convictions, but it, the basis of it was four deaths. And it's not four acts by Mrs. Crumbly. This is a very unusual case. Well, if there were if there were specifically four deaths intended, she would be charged with homicide, right? Is that true? That would be true. But as with involuntary manslaughter, so if a person drives a car and ends up killing six people, there could be six counts. Okay? But this situation is distinguishable because we have a different person who comes in as an adult, makes decisions, and takes any of what could be possible out of Mrs. Crumbly's hands. Okay, he, was, he wasn't an adult. He was charged as an adult. I, Isn't there a difference? Well, yeah, you're right. He, I'm saying, though, he was charged as an adult. Mm -hmm. He was held accountable for those crimes. He made the decision on how many people to shoot. He went in and made intentional choices. My point is just that Mr. Crumbly and Mrs. Crumbly, and I, I apologize because I'm arguing for Mrs. Crumbly, but sometimes I'll mention both. The decision on the impact of this case was absolutely not in their control. It was not foreseeable. <coughs> and, and that's the basis of the objection. Even if we, we respect the jury's verdict, they found that gross negligence took place. We, we respect that. That's fine. We get that. But at the end of the day, Mrs. Crumbly shouldn't be sentenced as if she controlled the fact that four people were murdered or if the shooter had shot 100 people. Um, that's, that's the objection. And this is a unique issue. It's a unique issue in that there is not case law. And it's, it's going to be a matter of first impression. Um, Ms. Lehman, do you want to weigh in on this uh, PRB 7? I would, Your Honor. I also am objecting to the scoring at 20 points. I do believe that the proper score is for zero for reasons similar to those that Ms. Smith stated. Um, this is not a case where there were four separate grossly negligent acts alleged. It was one grossly negligent act. And, and quite frankly, we don't have the jury here to ask them what they found or if they found that there were multiple grossly negligent acts. There were four counts for the four deaths of the students. And Your Honor, I understand that having these conversations, it, I, I'm not trying to be callous to anyone, Your Honor. I know. Um, but the, the four counts were for the, the four deaths that occurred, not for four separate criminal acts on behalf of James Crumbly. I understand what the jury's verdict was. I understand that, Your Honor. However, it's not as though um, a, a a, a similar situation, Your Honor, would be running, speeding through four different stop signs and causing four different um, motor vehicle accidents resulting in death. That would be something similar to a concurrent or a subsequent felony conviction. In this case, it is arguably one grossly negligent act that resulted in four deaths. And I'll obviously also multiple injuries and, and other issues as well, Your Honor. But my position is that this should not be scored at, PRB 7 should not be scored at 20 points because it is one act, not multiple acts. And I don't believe that the sentencing guidelines properly um, consider the facts of this case. Again, we've never seen a case like this before, and I don't believe that the sentencing guidelines properly consider the facts of this case, Mr. Crumbly's case, or even Mrs. Crumbly's case, to adequately score PRB 7. And I believe it should be scored at zero. Um, I'm going to ask both the prosecutor and probation if you'd like to respond. Thank you, Judge. There is zero support for counsel's argument that PRB 7 should be scored at zero. The case law is clear. The statute is clear. There were four separate homicide counts. Four children were murdered on November 30, 2021. Because of that, each defendant was charged and then convicted of a homicide count, a voluntary manslaughter, each with its own elements. So we've argued back and forth about was this homicide or was it not. This is why the court issued the rulings the way the court did regarding the video and other evidence regarding photographs of what happened inside the school. The statute is extremely clear. Four separate counts. They don't get to have a scoring of zero as if three children weren't killed, Judge. It is clear what the law is. It has to be scored at 20 points. 
Um, anything further from probation? No, Judge. All right, well, I have reviewed this, um, thoroughly the sentencing uh, memos that you uh, have submitted, uh, as well as the pre-sentence investigation, um, the statute, and the case law, and I believe uh, PRP 7 is scored correctly with regard to both defendants. Your Honor, the next objection um, that Mrs. Crumbly raises is on offense variable 9, which is the number of victims. This analysis is the same as the arguments I just made on prior record variable 7. Um, when the shooter came in and made the decision on the number of victims, it became not a reasonably foreseeable conclusion that he would do what he did. And that is why scoring that at 100 points for multiple deaths, these guidelines don't take into account this very unique situation where a person is dead, charged and convicted and sentenced as an adult made that decision. And it is it violates due process and all of Mrs. Crumbly's constitutional rights to hold it against her that her son shot multiple people versus just one. So we would ask that that offense variable be scored at zero points. Excellent. do you want to play in that or? Yeah. I can, Your Honor, and, and that way the prosecution can respond once, Your Honor. All right, go ahead. Um, OB6, again, it scored at 10 points. Um, Are we talking about OB6 or OB9? I'm on OB6. Oh, wait. You said OB9 number of victims. I'm sorry. I can do OB9, Your Honor, if you'd like, and I go back to OB6. Right. I did, I went to OB9. I can do OB9, Your Honor. Okay, um, OB9, similar arguments to PRB7, Your Honor. Um, it was not Mr. Crumbly who pulled the trigger on the firearm that killed the four students, Your Honor. I, I, I'm making the same arguments. I don't think that I need to reiterate them, but I believe that it should be scored at zero. Thank you, Judge. Regarding offense variable 9, <coughs> The jury did find he was reasonably foreseeable. It's jury instruction 1615, 1618, 1610, Judge. Two juries, 24 individuals, 24 citizens, found them guilty and found this act to be reasonably foreseeable. Had they not, they could have found guilty. That's the law. Now, again, there is no justification for scoring at zero. They are homicide offenses. Each is a separate count. The statute is clear. The case law is clear. We provided supporting information and documentation in our sentencing memorandum. The story has to be one way. Anything else we have in addition? No, Judge, thank you. All right, well, well I agree. I, I've spent, even before receiving any of your sentencing memos, I spent uh, an, an incredible amount of time um, going through all the guidelines, and I, I believe that OB9 is scored correctly to um, pursue it to the pre sentence investigation, the statute, as well as the case law in this matter. All right? Your Honor, Mrs. Crumbly's next objection is to offense variable six which is the offender's intent to kill or injure another individual. We would object to the scoring of this variable because Mrs. Crumbly did not have intent to kill or injure another individual, even if she was grossly negligent and obviously found guilty of gross negligence, that does not mean she intended to kill or injure another individual. We know who intended <coughs> to kill or injure another individual, and that's the shooter. He was held responsible, he was charged, he pled, he was held responsible, and, and we would object to the scoring of OB6. Okay, OB6 says, or there was gross negligence amounting to an unreasonable disregard for life, right? Or. I agree with you, but the problem is, is that, again, these sentencing guidelines don't take into account another person coming in and making those decisions. So. If that's the problem, and that's what makes all of these guidelines not exactly fit with the circumstances of this case. You know, I, did you guys read, I sent you a case named Albers. Did you read that case? I thought that was interesting. 258, Mishap, 578. There, I, I, I thought that was telling. There was a, you know, a number of victims in this apartment and someone a fire someone was a fire starter a known fire starter injured all kinds of people there and um, I think that had more to do with OB3 but I, I thought that was a, a telling case uh, Ms. Ms. Lehman, the difference your honor in that case though is that there wasn't somebody 
who was charged as an adult that intervened and made the choice to hurt everyone in that apartment building. That's the difference in this case, is that Mr. and Mrs. Crumbly did what they did or didn't do, but when their son came in and made decisions, again, it took it out of their hands. And if he had made the decision to do something different with that weapon, we wouldn't be here with that scoring. That's, that's the difference. I don't think they, they were charged based on what he did with that, that weapon. They were charged on, with everything they did and didn't do up to the time that he used that weapon, right? What he did from the moment he started shooting is, is not really the crux. I agree with you, and that's why the problem is, is that because he got involved, the offenders in this case did not have any intent on their part, and so it just makes it very distinguishable from any other case of involuntary manslaughter. It complicates it enormously, and it really does become an issue of first impression um, in this case. Ms. Lane. Yes, Your Honor. Um, for OB6, it's currently scored at 10 points. The defense, uh, Mr. Crumbly, requested it be scored at zero points. The prosecution asserted two separate theories during trial, um, which were both read to the jury. We don't know which theory the jury relied on. If they all relied on the same theory, if they all relied on different theories, if half of them relied on one and half of them relied on the other. Unfortunately, Your Honor, we don't know the answer to that. So the issue that we have is that there are two theories under which Mr. Crumbly could be convicted during trial. We know that he was convicted because we're here at sentencing. But neither of them takes into account the fact that there was no evidence presented that Mr. Crumley was aware of what his son was planning. There's the, the guidelines, and specifically OB6 doesn't take into account that there was no evidence presented during the trial that Mr. Crumley was not aware that his son had obtained access to, the, to any firearms in the home. And again, for these reasons, it's the intent. I understand that gross negligence is a part of the scoring runner. However, it's, it's disregard for human life. There was no evidence presented that James Crumley had disregard for human life, whether it's believed he was grossly negligent or not, Your Honor. There was no evidence presented during trial. Again, notwithstanding the jury's verdict, I understand what the verdict was, Judge, but the guidelines themselves, the scoring, which is what we're doing right now, this is not retrying the case, this is just scoring the guidelines, and the guidelines themselves, Your Honor, do not take into account the specific facts of this case and the evidence that was presented during this case. So for those reasons, Your Honor, I'm asking that will be 60 scored at zero on behalf of James Crumley. Prosecution. Thank you, Judge. Um, in Jennifer Crumley's memo, there was no objection to OB6. We did respond and articulate reasons why. In James Crumley's memo, I asked the court to take that argument from our memorandum into consideration regarding Jennifer Crumley's case as well. First, I'd like to address the counsel's repeatedly calling this case a first impression. This is a rare case. It's a unique case, but it's not a case of first impression. The legal duty in Michigan has been around for years, as has involuntary manslaughter and the law surrounding involuntary manslaughter. We actually cited Albers to the Court of Appeals as well as to this court in our response to the defendant's initial motion to quash in early 2022. Mm -hmm. That case is, in, is on point, as is People v. Cole, which is cited and attached to our sentencing memorandum. The jury instruction is clear, 1618 and 1615, Judge, OB6, 10 points are when there was gross negligence amounting to an unreasonable disregard for life. Compare that to our jury instructions and the, the, the case in, in People v. Cole, where the Court of Appeals specifically said, acting in a grossly negligent manner where it was apparent that serious injury could result implies that defendant Cole was acting with an unre unreasonable disregard for life. OB6 should be scored at 10 points. Anything additional confirmation? No, thank you. I believe OB6 is correctly scored. Your Honor, this is Crumley's next objection, um, and again, this is along the same analysis as the prior objections, is to offense variable 13, the continuing pattern of criminal behavior. This case is scored based on there being four resulting murders and multiple injuries in this case. And again, this factor was ripped out of the hands of Mr. Crumley when the shooter decided to make a continuing pattern of behavior and resulted in multiple harms and murders. 
Mrs. Crumbly did not exhibit a continuing pattern of criminal behavior. There were not four or multiple counts of gross negligence, um, and therefore we would just object to it being scored at all. Ms. Yes, Your Honor. For OB 13 for Mr. Crumbly, a single felonious act cannot constitute a pattern. Um, People versus Carl, 322 Mishap 690, um, is a court of appeals case which indicated that a defendant's multiple convictions for reckless driving causing death or serious impairment arose from his single act of driving recklessly. Um, he had passengers who were injured. There, were, there was at least one death that occurred. The court of appeals found that it was error to score OB 13, even though the driver of the car, um, who was the defendant, struck and killed uh, someone, and passengers in the defendant's car were seriously injured. So, Your Honor, this would be something similar. Um, this is arguably one act that resulted in four deaths. This is not four separate acts. Going back to my discussion, and, and I believe PRB 7, Your Honor, running four different stop signs. Those are four separate and distinct acts resulting in injuries or deaths. In this case, we don't have that. It is arguably one grossly negligent act that resulted in four deaths. And Your Honor, I'm not in any way trying to minimize that those students were killed, Your Honor. But in scoring the points, it's currently scored at 25 points for the four deaths and not four separate acts. Those four separate acts were committed by Mr. Crumbly's son based on, according to the jury, his one act of gross negligence. And again, we don't know what act the jury relied on. We don't know if they believe that there were multiple. We don't know, quite frankly, Your Honor. But there are four distinct acts, four separate acts of gross negligence that resulted in each of the four deaths of the students. Um, so again, Your Honor, for these reasons and the reasons that I stated in my memorandum, which I, and I do cite additional case law for the court, uh, I believe that OB 13 should be scored at 25 points on behalf of James Crumbly. Well, I did read the case I'm sorry, zero points, Your Honor. I, I did read the case law in your briefs, but there's more, I think there's some more recent case law provided by um, the prosecution in their brief. I don't know if it's Herman or Gibbs. Uh, do you want to respond? Yes, that's great. Thank you. First of all, OB 13 does permit the court to score 25 points when the incident occurred on one day. There was substantial evidence pre presented to the jury to show this was not one isolated act. Gross negligence occurred over a, a period of time. There was absolutely a pattern of gross negligence that culminated in the shooting on November the 30th, 2021. Um, just off the top of my head, buying the gun. <coughs> not locking the not locking the firearm up, not taking him home when when asked, uh, not asking him about the gun on November the thirtieth, not reacting in, in a variety of different ways when shown that that math worksheet on November thirtieth. There wasn't one single act of gross negligence. It occurred over a continuum. We presented evidence in the Jennifer Crumley case from March two thousand twenty one till December of two thousand twenty one, in the James Crumley case again March from two thousand twenty one to December of two thousand twenty one. Over the period of those uh, eight months, Judge, there were a number of acts for this court to rely upon. We do believe that OB 13 is appropriately scored at 20. <coughs> Anything else from probation? Um, again, I'm, I, I have reviewed um, all the PRBs and OBs and the case law in the statute, and I believe it's correctly scored. Your Honor, the next objection Mrs. Crumley has is to offense variable 19. This is a different type of argument than the prior argument, so I just want to let the court know. Um, this offense variable is to be scored when a defendant interferes with or attempts to interfere with the administration of justice. And the reason this was scored against Mrs. Crumley is because of the claim that she tried to run and tried to avoid arrest. On the night before charges were issued, I texted Miss McDonald directly, which I attached to my memo, and said, I, just, I, I, don't, I, I know it's argument, Judge, but we've been over this before a number of times. And of course, a, a charged felon doesn't get to text somebody. I to read, and the court is already indicated that, Judge. I ask you to move on. I'm going to let her make her sure argument, sure. but I, I, we've had this discussion before. Law enforcement does not have to ask for permission to arrest someone. If, if I have an outstanding warrant, one of these deputies could come up to this bench right now and cuff me. I understand that, but what the prosecution has done is put together a false narrative 
that's been repeated by the media over and over and over. And it's been repeated in court. Miss McDonald is the one who said they were in an industrial building. She's the one who used the word it was abandoned. A a a it was a warehouse, a non-retail place that was closed at night. It, right? it was not a warehouse. It was a building that had businesses in it. It was a non-retail building. No, there are there are retail businesses in there, and there are businesses in there that are not retail businesses. Either way, it was not an abandoned warehouse. Okay. Okay. And then the prosecution argued and put on the record. I, I guess it's hard for me to understand why it matters whether it was abandoned or not. Okay, because the narrative the media has played over and over and over repeats inaccurate information. I can't it, control the media. Trust me. I I understand. However, the prosecution also stated falsely and knowingly falsely, based on the fact they had a video of when Mrs. Crumbly and Mr. Crumbly were found, the prosecution claimed they were crouched under a mattress, which is just not true. They were laying on a mattress, on a mattress. Right. At the time, though, they made it sound like they're crouching and hiding, and the media reported that over and over and over, and that has been a major problem throughout this case and why I asked this court for a gag order. And we were thankful for the gag order. It did eliminate some more of the narrative coming out. But the prosecution very successfully painted this picture of people on the run. Meanwhile, Ms. Lehman and I can't do anything more to get our clients turned in. We are desperately calling the prosecutor's office, filing appearances with the court, making arrangements. Our clients are being threatened so badly they are terrified to just go walk into a jail where everyone is looking for them in Michigan. We plan to be with them as their attorneys, and it's complete garbage that the prosecution has been able to carry this narrative out through trial. And that's why I did attach my text messages to Ms. McDonald letting her know. <coughs> All she had to do was say, I am charging. She did not let me know. She does not have to do that. It's a professional courtesy that most prosecutors do. It just is. <coughs> in a case like this, I would not Ms. Lehman. Because, well, there's different arguments for each defendant. That's correct, Your Honor. They are different arguments. Okay. So I just want to address this briefly, Judge. First of all, this court may recall the text messages that the court allowed to be admitted in the Jennifer Crumley case. At 11.16 p.m. That's correct, Judge. Text message between Shannon Smith and the defendant. Mm -hmm. We're hiding out. We may have been found. And then the response was, oh shit. Oh, Judge, Judge I object. That's not that's what it was. That evidence. came, right, but that was not texted by Mrs. Crumley. Okay, well, she was already asleep. Okay, here, here's the problem with that. Because the evidence has shown, um, at both of the set, defendant's sentencing memos address the arrest in Detroit. You've suggested on numerous occasions that the prosecutor was required to make arrangements we're one, we're with one or more, both of the defendants to turn themselves in. I, I know that in circumstances where someone is charged with a retail fraud, something like that, you might get a common letter. They're not required to do it. Do we, do we all, all want things to happen the nice way? Sure. But it's, it's, it's not true. Law enforcement is not required to ask permission to arrest people. The fact of the matter is the charges were announced at noon. They knew about the charges. You knew about the charges, right? Not until after the press conference. At noon. And then we okay. were trying to it's make arrangements. Dime. It's my dime. Sorry. You, they do not have to make arrangements with you. I know that's the nice way. That's the safe way. The, sh the fugitive apprehension team was in contact with you. The defendants were aware and did not turn themselves in. They went to a non-retail establishment in Detroit and hunkered down. It's unclear to this court to this day whether they intended to flee the state. But the fact remains that they brought the circus to the city of Detroit. They did. There was all, there's also been testimony by Mrs. Crumley and an allegation by Mr. Crumley in the sentencing memo that the defendants were not avoiding detection in that building. That allegation flies in the face of the testimony at each of the trials. We had testimony from Luke Kirkley. He testified that he made eye contact with Mr. Crumley in the parking lot. He went back into the building. We see that on the video uh, at the art studio building, industrial building, whatever you want to say, that the defendant, Mr. Crumley, followed Luke 
back into the building just after that. Luke immediately called 911 at 10.43. I, I review the te all the testimony in this area. The Detroit police arrived 20 minutes after that 911 call. Their text from Mrs. Crumley's phone at 11.16 p.m., despite the fact that she testified she took four Xanax, drank vodka, and was asleep by 11 p.m. That is simply not true. Numerous agencies, including the Detroit Police Department, Border Patrol, SWAT, the Oakland County Sheriff's Department, and the Oakland County Fugitive Apprehension Team descended on this industrial building. The Detroit SWAT team entered the building at midnight and started breaking down doors with a steel ram. They started on the second and third floor. They obtained a key to the door where the defendants were on the first floor an hour and a half later. The suggestion that the defendants were asleep and did not hear this is, is highly improbable. Thank you, Judge. The only addition I have to that is the court referenced the testimony from, from the trial judge, and I appreciate that because Sar retired Sergeant Hendrick, as well as Lieutenant Willis, testified very clearly upon multiple questions. Is the sheriff's office function to, to trigger the fugitive apprehension team? Is a law enforcement function? It doesn't happen because of a, a request or a demand by the prosecutor's office. It's wholly separate and distinct. That was clear in the testimony. I just want that paper on the record. <coughs> Thank you, Judge. Um, did you want to make a different statement about that? I did, Your Honor. Mm -hmm. um, it is because I, I don't believe that Mr. Crumbly was assessed 15 points for OB-19 for the same reason as Mrs. Crumbly was. Um, Mr. Crumbly was assessed 15 points um, for, it says in the guidelines, the offender used the force or the threat of force against another person or the property of another person to interfere with, attempt to interfere with, or the result in the interference with the administration of justice or the rendering of emergency services. Your Honor, if I read that scoring to be scored because of the claims made by Ms. McDonald's office that Mr. Crumbly has made threats and threats of physical harm to Ms. McDonald um, over the phone yes. at the jail. Um, Your Honor, I'm disputing, and I have disputed, I did it during the trial when this was originally raised, and I've done it since then, that, that Mr. Crumbly has ever made a physical threat against Prosecutor McDonald. He has vented, he has been angry, he has been angry for the reasons that I cited in my sentencing memorandum, but he has never threatened to physically harm Ms. McDonald. He has never said that if you continue with this prosecution, I'm going to hurt you. He has never said, if you don't stop this right now, I'm coming after you. Instead, <coughs> as I indicated in my sentencing memorandum, the statements made by Mr. Crumley, although there has been some language that may not be very respectful, that may be angry out of frustration for being incarcerated and on lockdown for 23 hours a day for the last two and a half years for something that Mr. Crumley and I maintain that he did not do illegally or wrong. But he, he vented his frustrations, Your Honor, and he never threatened harm. He never said if Ms. McDonald continues that he's going to do something, or Mr. Keese, or Mr. Williams, or anyone else at the prosecutor's office or law enforcement. So he scores 15 points presumably based on these claims of threatened physical harm against Ms. McDonald, which we dispute ever happened. Um, Mr. Crumbly and I maintained that OB-19 should be scored at zero. Um, again, we also dispute that he was ever fleeing, so even if the prosecution wanted to change their theory to the flight, we would dispute that he was even fleeing, although I understand what the court just indicated and what Mr. Keese has indicated previously. So for the purposes of scoring, OB-19 should be scored at zero, there have been no threats of physical harm. There have been no interference with the administration of justice. Um, there, there is a, a thumb drive of the threats. We could play them, or Mr. Keast could read them into the record. I don't know to what extent the prosecution would like to address. I, I do. I, I hope not to, Judge, but I do need a response in here. I'm, I'm not going to read all of them. They're on page four of our sentencing memorandum. And, I, and we did attach them as the court indicated. So I know the court has listened. Mm -hmm. OB-19 should be scored at 50 points if the offender used force or the threat of force against a person to interfere with or attempt to interfere with the in administration of justice. I don't know any other purpose for what James Crumbly did other than to interfere with the administration of justice. He knew specifically that his jail calls were reported. He knew, or at least he believed, that the elected official, Ms. McDonald, was listening to him because he sent a message specific to her. He did it not just in an abstract sense, Judge. He did it while she was actively prosecuting the case. I have had a number of instances where defendants threatened witnesses, 
Rarely do we see a defendant threatening the prosecutor, let alone a member of a trial team, let alone the elected official. There will be retribution. She's going to be fucking sucking on a fucking hot rock down in hell soon. I am on a fucking ramp. I'm on. I am fucking on a rampage, Karen. Yes, Karen McDonald. Your ass is going down, and you better be fucking scared. I didn't want to read that, Judge. That was just a few weeks before the trial. I don't know any other definition what that could be other than a specific threat made to a member of the trial team. We ask that this defendant be treated no differently than any other defendant who would make a similar statement to any prosecutor or defense attorney or judge in this building. OB-19 is certainly <coughs> correctly scored at 15 points. Um, I believe that it's correctly scored with regard to Mrs. Crumley and Mr. Crumley based um, on their avoidance avoiding uh, law enforcement while at the art studio, industrial building, whatever you want to call it, um, on that evening uh, for a long period of time. Um, but in the alternative, um, there, there's alternative theories uh, for scoring OB-19 as re uh, with regard to Mr. Crumley. I, you know, regardless of his ability to make good on those threats because of his incarceration, I still uh, do believe that those uh, were, were threats against the prosecutor. Thank you, Judge. Your Honor, Mrs. Crumbly has no further <coughs> objections to the scoring <coughs> at this time. Slayman. Mr. Crumbly has no additional objections to the scoring, Your Honor. Um, I have a number of written um, statements that were provided by various individuals. I'm, I'm going to read the names of the people. Um, could you tell me the pronunciation of Madison Baldwin's mother's name, Nicole Boussoulet? Yes. Boussoulet. Um, um, and the mother of Hannah, Ms. Ms. St. Juliana. Is it I? I. I. St. Juliana, Kristen Baldwin, Baldwin, Raina St. Juliana, Steve St. Juliana, Jill Suave, Molly Darnell, Daniel Kozak, Andrew Muska, Marla Lay, Olivia Up Upham, Renee Upham, Megan Gregory, Patricia Cunningham, Linda Russo. Those are individuals uh, who provided written statements, and I have copies of those. Um, I wasn't sure who had what statements, so they were scanned by my office and sent to everyone yesterday. Um, I know that there are a number of individuals who want to um, address the court. I guess I should ask if at any time anybody feels like they need a break, they should tell me. All right. All right. So um, you do not. You have not objected. Correct. Yes. All right. Correct. Do you want to do that at this time? Could we take a break now? Yeah. Do you before the impact statement? Yeah, do you need a break? Oh, um, I guess I would ask, you've had time to review the written statements, correct? Your Honor, we did get them late last night. I'm going to read over them during this brief break again. I have read over them once, but I'm going to read again just to ensure that there are no objections. Yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't have reason to believe that you didn't have copies of them, but um, they weren't necessarily funneled to the probation department. Some of them were sent directly to us. We, I've gotten letters from people from across the country that were very interesting. So, um. Your Honor, may I, may I say one thing uh, regarding the victim impact statements? Um, the, the victims are not in the courtroom required to provide their, their oral statement to us before they deliver it. Correct. And some chose to do that. Correct. Some chose not to. Based on our prior experience with the shooter sentencing, sometimes they chose to submit it, and it was different when they delivered it. So I just want to make it clear that um, we, we under the Crime Victim Rights Act, nor do I think it's appropriate to have any um, control or edit or, or of what they're going to say because it's, it's their impact statement. So. Uh, yeah, I understand. And I, I have gotten some written statements from individuals who I believe intend to make an oral statement as well. So, yeah, that, that's, that's up to the individual. All right? Your Honor, with respect to the statements, initially um, the defense for Mrs. Crumley was concerned about the number of statements 
We believe that the court can sort through what to take into consideration for this sentencing, and plus the court has lots of experience doing so. And so we do, if at some point there was an objection in terms of discussion, we, we don't have an objection at this time. Yeah, I, you know what, I, you, you guys were on this email yesterday that uh, discussed all the individuals who, were, who would be giving oral statements. Correct, Your Honor. Yes. Correct. And um, I know we all went back. I, I think we've all discovered a little glitch in the Crime Victims' Rights Act that um, it's not specifically clear um, who's considered a victim of the Crime Victims' Rights Act. There's some um, difference of opinion maybe, but I'm, I'm again relying on Albers that discusses OB3 and gives a broad definition. Of, of who a victim is. In any event, I am inclined to hear oral statements from all the individuals that were listed in the email that um, went to all of you last night. All right? We have no, I have no objection to the individuals on that list, Your Honor. All right. Yeah, same here. <coughs> and I, I certainly would appreciate you making any objections to their statements um, um, at the end of, of their statement, all right? Your Honor, I, I don't know if we need to approach on that because there was some discussion by email about the objections. Okay, well. Um, or maybe we can handle it during the break, Judge. All right. When you say making an objection while the individual, I, I'm going to insist that everyone keep their um, statements directed at sentencing, for sure. Okay? Your Honor, I don't anticipate, and I don't, and I don't believe Ms. Smith would anticipate making objections to a victim impact statement. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, things could have happened, Your Honor. Excuse me. Um, and obviously, we have duties to our clients as well. We mm -hmm. wouldn't be doing it in a disrespectful way to anyone, Your Honor. But um, we would just ask, again, you've already reminded the court, I'm certain that the prosecutor's office has reminded anyone making a statement of what the guidelines are in relation to those statements. So I don't anticipate having to make an objection, Your Honor. But um, obviously, if, if one arises, an objection would have to be made, Judge. All right. All right. Uh, do your clients need to go downstairs? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah, just two things briefly. Um, there are no guidelines in the victim impact statement. It's, it's, it's how the victim's impact. It's, it's personal and unique. Judge. I, sure. You know, obviously, the court knows that. I just wanted to make sure we were clear on that. And we have to be directed at something. Right. And, and one um, housekeeping matter, we just need to, to add in, we can stipulate with the defense will stipulate, add in the additional victim impact statements received last night, as well as James Kremlin's GED verification. Um, just for the, for the PSI. Oh, I didn't ask you if you had any additions to the PSI. That's all. Today. I'm sorry. Okay. His, his GED and what else did you say? His GED verification and the additional victim impact statements that weren't received by the department. Yeah, I think we got some at about 6 o'clock, wasn't it, right? Right. So, yeah. If, if you're not in receipt of something, you should let me know. It, it, it was hard to determine at what at one time who was receiving what. So. If Maybe we can discuss with the prosecution who we should have impact statements from and determine whether or not we are missing any impact statements, the written impact statements. Because we did receive some later last night. I don't know if yeah, we sent those last night. Mm -hmm. I received what the court sent and mm -hmm. what's in the PSIR. Correct. That's what I received. I don't think there's anything else. We received one this morning. By Mr. Schilling. Yes, sir. But I believe Mr. Schilling is going to make an all statement. Correct. Is that correct? Yes, so sir. I wasn't concerned about that. Thank you. I was, I was referring to the written letters received by the court. Okay. Which, those are, that's what we got last night. Right. Everything in my possession was sent. Thank you very much for clarifying, Judge. All right. All right, so um, um, both of the defendants are going to go downstairs, so I want everyone to remain seated during that. All right? Thank you.
Recording in progress. Your Honor, calling People vs. James Crumbly, case number 222799989FH. Calling People vs. Jennifer Crumbly, case number 222799990FH. Thank you. Good morning, Mark. Case number of people. Karen McDonald, on behalf of the people. Good morning, Your Honor. Marielle Lehman, on behalf of James Crumbly, who is seated to my right. And I'm Shannon Smith on behalf of Jennifer Crumbly, who's seated to my right. Good morning. Um, I, now we're going to conduct the uh, oral victim impact statements, correct? Your Honor, if I could have just a couple of very brief moments. I neglected to make an argument on OB9 earlier. If the court could just allow me to make a very brief record, I would appreciate it. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, very briefly, People versus McGraw, 484 Mish 120 is a 2009 case, which indicates that the, the sentencing guidelines and scoring of those guidelines are limited to the sentencing offense. Obviously, we have four separate counts um, in the information in this case. Mm -hmm. People versus Vanilla Machado, that's a hyphenated name, 489 Mish 412, is a 2011 case, which states that you cannot aggregate offenses for the purposes of scoring. So where they're separate in that case, it was assault. They couldn't aggregate the assaults for the purposes of scoring, that each assault had to be scored separately. In this case, the score for offense variable nine is 100 for the multiple deaths that occurred for the deaths of the four students. Mm -hmm. I'm objecting to the scoring of 100 under Bonilla Machado um, because each death is supposed to be counted separately and individually and not aggregated for multiple deaths. And that, that was the only objection I wanted to make. Um, Mr. Keese, I'm going to allow you to address that. I, th I think you already did, but. I did, Judge. Yes. Okay. The probation has anything to add to it for Ms. Wheeler, but right. we've already made this argument. Ms. Wheeler? Anything else? Um, judge, only that the sentencing guideline manual states that you cannot aggregate victims of separate crimes. But I, I think the defense argued earlier that this wasn't a separate crime. Um, and the shooting occurred in a span of eight minutes. Uh, it, it was not one shooting and then a half hour later, uh, it was a very quick procession. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, all right, I, again, I believe it's correctly scored, but. Thank you for allowing me to make the record. Sure, around. no problem. No problem. Um, all right, and then with regard um, to victim impact statements. Yes, sure. Good morning. Good morning. I wasn't doing a great job at the French pronunci pronunciation of your name, Nicole Beausoleil. Correct? Correct. Was that right? Yes. All right. Um, what do you have to say? Um. All right. Um. I, would, I would like to start with the person that matters the most. Madison, she was a kind soul. She always had a smile on her face. She lit up the room when she walked in. Her laugh I could listen to all day. It was infectious. Her big sister's skills were undeniable and she took that role very seriously. Madison was smart, funny, loving, passionate, determined, and genuine. Her expectations were high and at times we needed to let her fall. She needed to be reminded that not everything is perfect, even if she wanted it to be. Madison had an influence that most never achieved. Sometimes I would listen to a poem she wrote or watched her create art with no tracing, just pure talent. She would talk about college and what majors she would like to do and what would be most helpful to society. The passion that she had for everything and everyone was remarkable. I would catch myself watching her and thinking to myself, how lucky am I? I'm the one that gets to be her mom. What did I do to deserve a perfect person? She will be the best thing to ever happen to me at such a young age myself. I grew up because of her. We grew together. I learned from her. 
I mattered because of her. From the moment she was born, I promised myself that I would be there no matter what. Through the falls, heartbreak, letdowns, and struggles, I would be there. I would listen, learn, and love every moment. I wouldn't miss a thing. I would always protect her. On November 30th, 2021, exactly 17 years, 6 months, and 13 days, made me break my first promise, and it will hurt for eternity. As her mom, I didn't protect her. First, I'd like to say thank you to the prosecution team. I say thank you to you all. Saying thank you really doesn't seem enough anymore. The countless hours you've worked, the time away from your family, and always taking our feelings into consideration. Karen and Mark, the work you've put into getting all the facts, speaking to us, speaking to us like we matter, and never wavering from your goal. It speaks volumes of the people you are, and I'm proud to call you a part of Madison's voice. Advocates and Jen, I'm not sure where to start. You've all seen me hit points in this tragedy that some days I wasn't sure who I was. One minute I'm laughing, next I'm crying, and sometimes I'm just silent. Either way, one thing stayed consistent. You always listened. Jen, you're not just a friend, you are family. My mind keeps going back to something during the trials. Something that is almost on repeat like a broken record. It's something as a mother I can't understand. And honestly, I don't think any mother, mother would understand. It was when Jennifer said, it wouldn't do anything different. I'm putting a little emphasis on different as I know life throws us things that are out of, out of our control. But life takes turns and eventually puts them back in our control. Like giving you a hint when something needs to change. I want to compare a few things to see through my perspective. As I know things are different about the events and how we see them from the events on November 30th. While your son was hearing voices and asking for help. I was helping Madison pick out her senior classes while you were perching, seeing a gun for your son and leaving it unlocked. I was helping her finish her college essays while you dropped him off at school, upset that he was failing class. I texted Madison, drive safe and slick outside, have a good day. When you got a call to me at the school about your son and how it interfered with your day. I was rearranging my schedule so I could take Madison to get her oil changed for the first time. When you left without hesitation and not taking him home, I was worried if she'd be okay driving in the first snowfall of the season and if she brought a coat. When you walked out of the office with a steady pace after hearing an active shooter, I ran from my home and started driving trying not to break the law. When you were on the phone for 10 minutes with each other trying to figure out where the gun was, I was on the phone with her father and family trying to figure out where she was. When you left the Myers without knowing where your son was, I was desperately trying to get there as soon as possible. When you knew the gun was missing, you called the police, knowing it was your son who took it. I was having family call every hospital describing what she looked like. When you texted, Ethan, don't do it. I was texting Madison, I love you, please call mom. When you found out about the lives your son took that day, I was still waiting for my daughter in a parking lot. When you questioned the reasoning on why you would do this, I was questioning if I would, was doing enough to find her. When you got a chance to speak with your son, seeing him alive and showing no support, I was watching families reunite with their children, waiting for my moment. When you asked him why, 
I was waiting for the answer on to why the last bus never came. When you, when the police showed up at your house, you didn't understand why they were there. And I was asking police if they checked every possible location and if I could go search too. When you texted about not losing your job and you needed a lawyer, I was still calling my daughter because she came first in all parts of my life. When you could leave your house, I was still a prisoner in Myers. When you worried about what people thought of you and feeling threatened, I was learning your son threatened my daughter and fatally shot her in the head. When you drove to get your burner phones for communication, I was laying on the floor in Myers for hours crying because I forgot how to speak. When you checked into your first hotel, I was telling Madison's 11 year old sister she was gone. When you cared more about yourself and getting alcohol and supplies, I was identifying my daughter in a medical office wishing I could take her place. While you were hiding, I was planning her funeral. And while you were running away from your son and your responsibilities, I was forced to do the worst possible thing a parent could do. I was forced to say goodbye to my Madison. We all see things different. Some prioritize and some don't. Accountability can only be given if you actually try it in the first place. As a parent, we all make mistakes. This is a normal way of life. Usually when mistakes happen, we learn from them. We try to fix it or talk it over. But continuing to make the same mistake over and over again is no longer a mistake, it's a choice. That becomes a decision. Those decisions that you made ultimately took my, life, my daughter's life because you decided that you didn't want to parent and listen to your son. You took the right away for me to be a mother. You do not get to decide that. You do not get those privileges. You are not above anyone. I love being a mom. It's the one thing that I'm truly great at. You cared more about your well-being than the one life that you should put above anyone, your child. And because of that, you took that you both took four beautiful children away from this world. Being a parent is the best, is the part of life that you should hold to the highest level. It's an honor to be a mother or a father. Even when you think you have done your best, you continue to do more. Unfortunately, you, you never made it to level one. You say you wouldn't do anything different. Well, that really says on what type of parents you are, because there's a lot of things I would do different. But the one thing would, I would have wanted to be different was to take that bullet that day so she could continue to live the life she deserved. You show no remorse, no respect or compassion for our family. The same traits that you've bestowed upon your son, the traits that have torn my family into pieces, the lack of compassion that you've shown is outright disgusting. Not only did your son kill my daughter, but you both did as well. The words involuntary should not be a part of your offense. Everything you did that day, months prior and days after were voluntary acts of your son to commit a murder. Not just one, but multiple. Shaking your head during a verdict is the utmost disrespectful thing I have ever witnessed. At that moment, you felt your life was more valuable than my daughter's. I will say that will never be true. <coughs> you created a life that you took for granted. You decided that parenting wasn't a priority. Putting your child first should be the only priority. You didn't, and because of that, I've lost my daughter. I had to get answers after her death. Watching the video, hearing testimony on how your son executed my daughter, watching him put the gun to her head as she covered her head and pulled the trigger, seeing pictures of her laying in her own pool of blood, 
knowing her body sat there for hours, that rigor mortis had already started to set in. So that when I identified her, her body was in a state I couldn't imagine. Hearing her sister scream over and over again, <laughs> night after night, watching her family and her friends fall apart. You created all of this. You created your son's life, which then allowed this to be his path, which should be yours as well. You don't get to look away. You don't get to cry. I didn't get that choice. You failed as parents. The punish punishment that you face will never be enough. It will never bring her back. It will never be a loss that you have suffered, and it will never heal the pain. Because one day you're going to be able to see your son, visit, hear his voice, possibly laugh, maybe see him grow. I will never see that again. <coughs> the the so-called loss that you say you have suffered doesn't even compare to the loss of a child. Your Honor, I request that the maximum sentence be enforced as it will never come close to the life sentence I was given. A life sentence that I didn't ask for, but a choice that was made for me. A life that I will suffer because of their negligence. Negligence. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Jill Suave. All right, go ahead. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Honorable Judge Cheryl Matthews, for your time on this case. I know it hasn't been easy on both. Thank you also to Karen McDonald and the entire prosecution team. We appreciate your efforts. Your Honor, my trauma and devastation is hard to put to words but I have done so in my letter to you. I would also like to mention Justin's brothers, Nathan and Clay. They are now forced to live a life without their beloved middle brother, Justin. My son, Justin, was the least deserving of his fate. He was the best son that any mother could pray for. Justin was brave, spending his final moments protecting a fellow student. He was hardworking, a lettered athlete, a top honor student. He was kind and inclusive to all. He was full of love and joy. His future was so very bright and full of possibilities. His passing has touched so many family members, friends, students, and the community in general. The ripple effects of both James and Jennifer's failures to act have devastated us all. this tragedy was completely preventable. If only they had done something, Your Honor, anything, to shift the course of events on November 30th, then our four angels would be here today, and Justin would be getting ready to celebrate, celebrate his 20th birthday on the 18th of this month. If only, Your Honor, they had taken their son to get counseling instead of buying him a gun. If only they had secured that gun. <coughs> if only they had spoken up that day in the counseling office. If only they had checked his backpack. If only they had taken him home or taking him to counseling instead of abandoning him at that school. I wouldn't be standing here today. Your Honor, I don't know what's in their hearts, I'm not a mind reader, but I only know the facts of this case, and the facts of this case, both cases, have been deeply disturbing. What I would like to share with the shooter's parents is an example of what love looks like between a mother and her son. This is what Justin wrote to me on one of the last birthdays that we celebrated together. Dear Mom, 
Words cannot describe how thankful I am for you. You have been nothing but an amazing mother for as long as I can remember. Thank you for being a role model. Thank you for showing me what it's like to never give up. You inspire me to do better each and every day. I love you so much. Love, Justin. It is devastating and heartbreaking that it doesn't appear that either of you cherished or even wanted your son. But I wholeheartedly wanted and cherished mine. You have failed your son and you have failed us all. This failure had deadly consequences that can never be undone, that can never be made right. I am asking your honor for the maximum sentence allowed. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Craig Schilling, Dustin's dad. Um, so, Honorable Judge Matthews, for the second time in six months, I find myself standing in front of a packed courtroom, a victim. This time, I'm here to address a different judge and the parents of the deeply disturbed teenager that murdered my son. This is my opportunity to try to describe just how much the horrific event that took place back on November 30th, 2021, has impacted my life. It's my belief that an impact statement should not just describe how this particular event impacted me. I feel that it should also be impactful towards all who hear it. And in your case, Judge, I hope these words impact you in a way that influence your decisions here today. As I look around at all the lawyers, police officers, media folks, and the other victims, I can't help but ask myself, what could I possibly say that this whole scenario doesn't already say? This is messed up. Most people will never have to make a victim impact statement to the work of their lives. And the fact that the victims speaking here today are doing so for the second time in six months should speak volumes in and of itself. This is not normal. Living a life like this is not normal. So how does it affect a normal guy? To be completely honest with you, it remains a rather difficult and uncomfortable question to answer. In my previous impact statement, I've expressed many of my day-to-day -day struggles, from uncontrolled emotional outbreaks to sleepless nights, to not being able to focus on the normal daily tasks. Yeah, it's fair to say that I live every day with pain, anger, heartache, regret, anxiety, stress, you name it. They are all there, wreaking havoc in my once normal life. They say that time heals all wounds. Well, we're, we're coming up on two and a half years now, and I can assure you that the wounds are still as fresh as they were on that tragic day. And with this hole that has been left in my life, still glaringly obvious, I fight every day to not lose more of myself within that very hole. I have spent the last 30 years of my life busting my butt to support a family, raise children, and try to set myself up for some peace and quiet in the golden years of life. But the unthinkable has happened. And that peace and quiet I've worked so hard for may never come to be. At least not to the degree that I've always imagined it. Literally every single aspect of my life has been affected by this tragedy. And I could spend a long time describing in detail just how it has impacted me, but it seems like it would be way easier for me to just tell you how this tragedy hasn't impacted me, because there's simply nothing on that list. Now that the verdict is out on this monumental case, I feel strongly that it has caught the attention of most parents across the country. The overwhelming facts in this case were all that was necessary to prove that James and Jennifer Crumley not only neglected their son, by failing to get the necessary mental care that was clearly needed, <coughs> providing them the very tools necessary to carry out those heinous acts of violence. It was these very facts that allowed not just one, 
but two full juries to find both of them guilty of involuntary manslaughter. I will always maintain the opinion that the facts that were presented in these cases were strong enough to convince any jury of their guilt, and that the verdict would have been the same regardless of where the trial was held. As I have maintained throughout the course of the past couple of years, being the parent of a murdered child tends to cause you to seek out the maximum penalties allowed for each guilty verdict derived from any of the criminal charges. I think this stance is completely justified and would be so for any parent in, this position, in the same position as mine. However, this is a court of law where a person is innocent until proven guilty and the defendant has the right to dispute the facts of, of the charges against them. That being said, during the course of both of these trials, I did my best to capture every word and process all the facts. This is important because there is value in these facts, not just in the thousands and thousands of man hours invested in gathering, processing, and organizing the evidence, but also for being able to use that evidence to establish the cold, hard truth of this tragic situation, that James and Jennifer Crumley failed in their parental responsibilities as they pertain to the shooter, who was their son. The cold truth that shows that they did nothing to address the obvious signs of a deteriorating mental state of mind currently present within their son. And of course, the very hard truth that shows that they provided their son with exactly what he wanted to use to do what he did and failed miserably to secure it properly. One would probably think that in order for something like this, or something of this magnitude, to even happen at all, there would have to be a ton of things that went wrong. Although, there were some things that definitely went wrong that day. For several of those things, I believe that if they had been handled correctly, we wouldn't be here right now. And James and Jennifer Crumley carried the bulk of the responsibility needed to handle those things. During their trials, the overall similarities between the two were evident. And I believe this is why they were both convicted. Numerous facts that were the same for both trials showed clearly that the parents failed their son, and ultimately the entire community. With Jennifer, the thing that resonates most is that she stated that even knowing what she knew now, she still wouldn't have changed a thing. I almost died when she said that. Four precious lives were lost at the hands of her son by the means, by means that she helped provide. She saw the drawing of the murder drawn with the hands of her son. She sat and heard the request of the counselor and did nothing. And she still says, or says, that she wouldn't have changed a thing. I just don't understand how someone can be that heartless to make a statement like that. The blood of our children is on your hands too. This is but one reason why I feel that Jennifer should receive a maximum amount of hurt for her sentence. The facts presented should be all the others that you should need. With her distinct lack of remorse and overall unethical understanding of the tragedy, I feel that the maximum amount of time available is needed for her to be able to fully comprehend the gravity of her actions and the lack thereof. With James, there were a couple of things that jumped out at me in particular, but one thing that is the toughest to digest is the fact that when the verdict was being read, he sat there and shook his head in total disagreement, as if to suggest that the jury was wrong and that there were no grounds for a guilty verdict. I was dumbfounded to see him shake his head with such disbelief, an action that only suggests that he truly believes he did nothing wrong. How could you possibly think that? Four precious lives were lost at the hands of your son by means that he helped, by means that he helped provide. He saw the drawing of the murder, drawn with the hands of the son. He sat and heard the request of the counselor and did nothing. I just don't understand how someone can so arrogantly dawdle in a pool of self-pity without being able to say one thing to justify themselves. The blood of our children is on your hands too. This is but one reason why I feel James 
should receive the maximum amount of for his sentence. The facts presented should be all the others that you need. With this distinct lack of remorse and overall unethical understanding of the tragedy, I feel that the maximum amount of time available is needed for him to be able to fully comprehend the gravity of his actions in the last paragraph. Throughout the course of all of this, and I'm talking from way back in the beginning, I just can't get over the fact that this tragedy was completely avoidable. There were some pretty obvious signs that were completely overlooked, and the bulk of, of the responsibilities that address those signs lied on the parents, and they failed. Across the board, failed. They willfully ignored the cries of their child and selfishly put themselves before helping him. This type of blatant disregard is undeniably unacceptable. It is a large reason why the events of that, the events of that day were able or were allowed to happen, and another reason why I feel they both need the maximum amount of time available to be able to fully comprehend the gravity of their actions and the lack thereof. We all know that having children is a big responsibility. Although extremely rewarding, it starts out pretty scary. I mean, let's face it, they don't exactly come with instructions. There's no meet button, and unfortunately, no pause or rewind buttons either. Oh yeah, and there are times in the beginning that they really smell. Yet we still have them. We still want that responsibility, even though it's not very clear what it all entails. But how can we accept that responsibility and not act responsibly towards that child? It doesn't add up. A child, even if he is an oopsie child, deserves the same amount of love, compassion, and compare that every other child gets. A child deserves someone who is confident enough to lead by example. Because let's face it, it wasn't that child's choice to come into this world. You made them. And it's your responsibility to teach them how to live. It's your responsibility to, get a, to set a good example. It's plain and simple, just like that, ladies and gentlemen. And the sooner we can figure it out, figure that out, the better we all will be. Being a parent is hard work, but if it's done correctly, it can be the most rewarding work you ever do. There is no one that can tell you how to do it, because each child is so precious and unique. I mean, there's no other one like them in the entire world, and that says a lot. So cherish your one and onlys, and never give them up. Never give up on them. The results of doing so can be catastrophic and can affect the lives of so many other people. Well, I ask you all to go home today and hug your kids and make sure they know you are there for them and make sure that they are all right. It's so crucial for the whole of our society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sheldon. <coughs> Our 10-year-old little brother had to learn how to write a eulogy for his sister before he even learned how to write essays. November 30th, 2021, all our parents did was send us off to school. Yet the next time they see Hannah is to recognize her lifeless body in a medical examiner's office. I met up with Hannah and a friend during school that day. When we split ways to go back to class, I just looked back and smiled. I didn't say goodbye. I never got to say goodbye. I never got to remind her that I love her, that she's my everything, the person I want to walk through life with side by side. <coughs> I thought our future was a given. Of course she'd play her first high school basketball game that night, get ready for all the other school dances, have her JV and varsity season for all the sports she played, get her driver's license, play her lacrosse season, have her first date, prom, graduation. She never got a chance for any of that. She didn't even get her 15th, 16th, 17th, or 18th birthday. These are only some of the high school experiences she never got to have, but it is absolutely nothing compared to the rest of everything she had going for her future. That list is eternal. Hannah's life had only started to begin. 
12.51 p.m., November 30th, 2021, that was the moment I became aware of the fragility of our mortality. Hannah, who was healthy, Hannah, who was only 14, shot four times. 12.5% of the bullets shot that day were at her. She took her last breath in her own pool of blood in a school she hadn't even been in for three months. Alone for seven, mo seven minutes while police passed by her, bleeding out as a security guard failed to put a tourniquet on her, dying as EMS took more than 10 minutes after the shooter had been detained to even give aid to her. Our Japanese grandma would often worry about anything bad happening to us because she knew how dangerous it is here compared to Japan. She told me on FaceTime that Hana would respond with a laugh, saying, Don't worry, I'm a fast runner. I'll outrun them. It wasn't possible for Hana to outrun the bullets spot by you, Jennifer Crumley, which were fired by the 9mm SIG SAR that you, James, gifted to your son. Both used to murder Hana, Justin, Tate, and Madison. The fact is, no matter what you try to make yourself believe, Jennifer, you did fail as a parent, both of you. To love and to be loved, that is the human experience. It was up to you guys to show your son that. Instead of giving quality time and compassion, you gift your son a gun. A gun you knew caused extraordinary damage. There's a reason your kid didn't use the other two firearms or the .22 ammunition you own. I believe your actions cannot even be confined into the word failure. Your mistakes created our everlasting nightmare. So yes, you are still a danger to society because even after serving two years, you have yet to admit, admit to your wrongdoings. And we know that when we do not learn from our mistakes, we repeat history. You call yourself a victim. The difference between you and <coughs> Hannah, Justin Tate, and Madison, you and my family, you and all the students there that day, is that we didn't have a hand in causing this. You caused the most cruel thing I could ever imagine. You guys made loving Hana so painful. That is not a narrative, that is reality. For that, unless you have a time machine or the ability to stop time, there is no existing punishment or rehabilitation that will ever be enough. Because there is no way that the one life I have, I now have to live without Hana, my little sister, my best friend, my other half. To me, that makes the maximum sentence being 15 years too short. Hannah didn't even have 15 years to live. Jennifer, you stated that even after knowing everything you know now, you wouldn't do anything different. I cannot fathom that. I would do anything to hear her footsteps coming up the stairs. You don't have to roll your eyes, it's on video that she said that. To not have an empty seat at the dining table, to have her come into my room and ask which clothes to order, to see her napping on the couch, to laugh and share a look when we accidentally say the same thing at the same time. There's not a day that goes by that I wish I hadn't run out of that building. If I knew what I know now, I would do everything differently in a heartbeat. I hope time makes you think differently. One day, I hope you would have chosen to care for your son, teach him how to love and to be loved, that you would not choose to buy the bullets that enter children's bodies, that you would not choose to omit relevant important information to the counselor Sean Hopkins and Dean of Students Nicholas Ejak that could help their incompetent brains and one shared brain cell to decide to act and search the backpack. That you wouldn't still choose to hide from accountability when you're the reason we had to hide for our lives. That you would choose to save Hannah, Justin, Tate, and Madison. Like my mother said, both of you should implore that even on your worst days, it's the tomorrow Hannah doesn't get. The tomorrow she wanted to live so badly, the tomorrow that she should have. I can never do Hannah justice when talking about her. She's all I want to talk about, and yet I would need a lifetime and still wouldn't have the right words to capture incandescence, humor, thoughtfulness, kindness, or loyalty. She's always there for you, helping without a second thought. She's always sharing, whether it's her smile, her food, her clothes, her crafts, her joy. She's funny. <laughs> It's a given, she brings people together. Whether it's her contagious laughter or sarcastic wit, you will be laughing right along with her. She's noticing the small things, new shoes, new haircut, cute jewelry, but even more importantly, she makes you feel seen. She's extremely spirited. Her energy is unmatched on or off the court. She dresses up every holiday, every spirit day, the first one to put up Christmas lights, or any lights for that matter, not even realizing she was a light for so many others. She's the one who would not only playfully roll her eyes and smile when I would say I'm taller than her as I look up to her. 
Not only did I look up to her physically, because yes, she was taller, but as a whole, as a human being. She isn't perfect, but she's Hana, and to me, that's as close as you can get. I can't convey what losing Hana has done to me. I miss her with every breath I take. I think going forward without her is something I'll never be able to fully navigate. I believe the word sad is inappropriate to use because it does nothing to capture the hurt or the way my soul shattered. I didn't know. I've never felt every atom of my body igniting from anger until Hana was murdered. I didn't know what it was like to want to stop waking up in the morning until she wasn't here. I have never known pain that is forever until seeing Hana in a casket. I didn't know it was possible to feel so isolated even when you're surrounded by people. I didn't know how it feels to not know yourself at all. I have no idea who I am without Hana. She's my happy. She's my home. I look for Hana in everyone I meet, every place I go, and it's exhausting when I'm met with disappointment every time. But it's the world. It's all the people she would have met. I grieve for them too. To have that chance of Hana being in your life taken away from you is a tragedy in and of itself. She's more, she's more of a person than you two combined times a trillion could ever even hope to be. But when the day comes that you re-enter society in 13 years, I hope you live more like Hana. I hope you live every moment to the fullest like Hana. I hope you laugh every day like Hana. And I hope you love unconditionally like Hana. That's it. Thank you. Mr. St. Julian. Thank you. I find myself in a rather odd state of mind today. Rather emotionally blank right now. Part of that is having to do this again. Part of that is I'm mostly a private person. And the idea of having to pour my heart out again is irritating. And I can't match the eloquent words that have come before me in the previous impact statements. So I'll limit my my words today. The defendants, through their choices, through their indifference and gross negligence, enabled the son, their son to murder my daughter, Hannah, and three other children. They chose to stay quiet. They chose to ignore the warning signs. And now, as we've heard through all of the objections, <coughs> They continue to choose to blame everyone but themselves. Every single ob objection, I think, that the council said this morning, put the blame somewhere else, their son, not them. I stood before the court several months ago and spoke about the impact that Hannah's murder had on myself and my family. Nothing has changed since then. It's impossible for me to truly convey the complete impact of my daughter's loss. Hannah's murder has destroyed a large portion of my very soul. I've said these words before, it's still the truth. I remain a shell of the person that I used to be. I think of her and miss her constantly. Every day is a battle to attempt to move forward, to struggle to get out of bed, to go through the motions of everyday life. Simple everyday sights and actions bring pain, as I think what it should have been like with Hannah there with us. I think of all the good times that we've shared together as a family, and more than all of the memories that will never be. I will never think back fondly on her high school and college graduations. I will never walk her down the aisle as she begins 
the journey of starting her own family. I am forever denied the chance to hold her or her future children in my arms. A few words describing Hannah can in no way fully capture her truly beautiful, caring soul or impart, impart her unlimited, unlimited potential. Hannah was absolutely beautiful and thoughtful person. She was always the first person to notice when someone had a problem and the first to go out of her way to offer help. She was incredibly curious and talented. She continually tried new things. She crafted homemade jewelry, tried cooking her own recipes, and played several sports. She was a record holder in track and a leader of her school volleyball and basketball teams. She also hoped to join her older sister on the lacrosse team in the spring. She had aspirations of her career dedicated to helping people. All of this is lost because of the defendant's actions and choices. My position regarding the defendant's sentencing and their future has evolved through their trials. At first, I was focused on the importance of getting a, a guilty verdict, to have the message conveyed to the public that this type of behavior and choices are not acceptable. I didn't have strong feelings about their sentencing. It was just something that would be determined by the system. My view, however, has changed as the defendant's level of defiance has grown. Instead of acknowledging any mistakes, they continue to show no remorse. They take no accountability. They and their lawyers continue to try to change the narrative and portray the defendants as victims of the prosecution team. They blame everyone but themselves and make threats of retribution. The facts have already been presented. The jury has found them guilty. Multiple juries have found them guilty. Hannah, Madison, Tate, and Justin are the ones who have lost everything, not the defendants. As such, I ask that this court to sentence the defendants to the maximum allowable penalty of 10 to 15 years in prison. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here. Mr. Mir. Tate Mir's dad. <coughs> uh, first of all, um, Mark, Karen, the whole team. Strong work. Everybody said you couldn't do it, and you did it. For our family, it's not time to celebrate. This tragedy has taken hey, an incredible toll on our family. So our family is not going to give the Crumley family a second of our time up here. It's time to turn our focus now. This is the low hanging fruit. Now it's time to turn our focus to Oxford schools who played a role in this tragedy. You know, I hear this, this morning or listen to all the objections and hear Sharon talking about protecting the criminals, civil rights, constitutional rights. Where's my rights being protected? I fight for everybody in this room. My rights aren't being protected. Criminals' rights are more important than our rights, my rights.
We are ready for our government to perform an investigation on this tragedy. Many, many don't know that our government has not investigated this murder. A pre-shooting investigation, a day of the shooting investigation, and a deep dive investigation into the horrible response to this tragedy, the disrespect shown to us families, the simple things like trauma training for somebody like a Sheriff Bouchard who we got to talk to on the day that that we got to go identify Tate. And he referred to Tate as a girl because he was too busy that night working to cover up, cover it up, instead of learning what every about every kid, Tate, Hannah, Justin, and Madison. It's time for the whole truth to come out. It's time to learn from this, from the purchase of the gun to the response. That's when real change happens, is when we can look at something and we can evaluate it, apply lessons learned. That's when real change happens. So I'm a St. Juliana's family ready for the truth. Justin Shelley's family ready to hear the truth? Nicole Baldwin's family ready to hear the truth? Tate Mears' family's ready to hear the truth. Quit denying us that. It's time to drive real change from this tragedy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Things would have absolutely been different. 
Even worse, when I learned during the police investigation that he had been planning a school shooting before November 30th. He was not the son I woke up. But he was not the son I knew when I woke up on November 30th. The Ethan I knew was a good, quiet kid. He loved his pets, family vacations. My husband and I used to used to say we have the perfect kid. I truly believe that. And that's who I saw and thought I knew. As the details started emerging during discovery, I was horrified to learn concerning behaviors my son was reported doing at school. Refusing to take a makeup test, he told us he took. Sleeping in class. Drawing pictures of guns on his assignments. Writing, quote, my family is a mistake. Watching a video in class of a mass shooting that fatal day along with internal communications that took place between his teachers and counselor, Mr. Hopkins. That he is, quote, on my radar, and quote, he seems to be having a rough time, was never disclosed to us, his parents. The school claimed this was not abnormal behavior because of the pandemic and Oxford being in a, quote, gun community. To say I was furious to learn this information is an understatement. This is not normal behavior to us and very different than what Ethan was to believe was happening at school. Not only were you left in the dark about previous concerning behavior, but in the counselor's office that morning, none of those previous issues were brought to our attention. I can't stop thinking, had they been, the conversation that morning would have been much different. That we would have taken a deep dive into what's really been going on with my son. I wonder if Hopkins and Ejak have those same regrets too. Instead, we are led to believe, not only from Hopkins and Egypt, but from Ethan as well, that this was an isolated event. We felt confident in trusting the professional's advice to let him stay in school that day. Quote, he, did not, he does not pose a threat to himself or others. <coughs> it was suggested that him being around here would probably be good. We agreed. We were never asked to take him home that day. If that was discussed as the best course of action, we would have obliged. The prosecution keeps saying we didn't give them the big picture that morning at the counselor's office. But what they failed to acknowledge is the bigger picture the school did not give us. I'm not the same person I was prior to November 30th, 2021. This tragedy has changed who I am and has taught me some very valuable lessons. It's said in suffering, we gain wisdom. I've also gained God. In the quiet hours of myself, I prayed to him about the deep impact this tragedy has had on the families and the endless pain no one should ever have to feel. For as God who holds a true understanding of our pain. I've also learned to depend on him for peace and strength. Alone, I'm not strong enough. I've learned that we cannot tell or predict what will happen to us in this life. One day you wake up and everything can change. We can, however, decide what happens in us, how we take it, what we do with it. And that's what really matters in the end. That's the test of living, is how we take the unimaginable, the tragedies, the raw hardships, and make them a thing of worth and beauty. I've also learned to think, to never think this could not happen to you, and stereotype that bad kids come from bad parents. The prosecution has tried to mold us into the type of parents society wants to believe are so horrible only a school or mass shooter could be bred from. This is a very <coughs> assumption to have. We were good parents. We were the average family. We weren't perfect, but we loved our son and each other tremendously. Everything we strive for was to make sure our son had the best life we could give him, to grow up with traditions and experiences we had, to be the best person he could be. I know we did our best. The love I have for our son mixed with regret for not seeing what was ahead weighs heavily on me. My point is, this could be any parent here in my, up here in my shoes. Ethan could be your child, could be your grandchild, your niece, your nephew, your brother, your sister. Your child can make a fatal decision, not just with the gun, but a knife, a vehicle, intentionally or unintentionally. If there's anything the general public can take away from this, is that this could happen to you too. 
The tragedy has taught me the true meaning of unconditional love as I watch my parents still love and care for me wholeheartedly, no matter what has happened. If there's nothing else I can do right in life, I do still love my son unconditionally, and perhaps that is my purpose. Your Honor, I don't envy the decision you have to make today. I understand this is a novel case, and punishment expectations are high, not just from the prosecution, but from all those affected as well. The heartbreaking journey these families have endured. Hang on, I have to back up. I missed, I missed my most important I need to address. The most valuable piece of wisdom I gain is the power of forgiveness. To forgive the prosecution for the slander and hate against me and my husband. Ms. McDonald, Mr. Keith, I have hated you with deep anger, but hate is too heavy of the cross to carry. I need to be set free of that burden and recognize that you are people just like me, imperfect. Good child of God. I know he wants good things to happen to you, and in any conflict, whatever the circumstances, he is there loving both sides. To the victims and the families. I stand today not to ask for your forgiveness, as I know it may be beyond reach, but to express my sincerest apologies for the pain that has been caused. Your Honor, I don't envy you in the decision you have to make today. I understand the punishment expectations are high from, from all sides. This heartbreaking journey of families have endured is more than anyone should have to bear and acknowledge in its full depth. My time in confinement has been filled with deep remorse, regret, and grief over this tragedy. I have taken this one day at a time, trying to survive, navigate, and cope with the endless heartache, pain, and grief I feel for the families of Hannah, Justin, Madison, and Tate. I have also lost myself over my son's wrongdoing. I have been shredded by the public opinion of me, shamed as a horrible parent, pain to be a terrible person. But the worst how I carry is my own self-judgment, remorse, and deep regret. I've been criticized I don't show emotion. I'm unsympathetic. I don't cry enough. But alone I grieve. And if you were to look into me internally, you'd find I'd die on the inside. I will be in my own internal prison for the rest of my life. Your Honor, I ask you to take into consideration that I have been locked in a cell 23 hours a day, essentially in solitary confinement, for over 28 months, and that the court finds a fair and just sentence for me. Thank you. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. Um, Your Honor, as I pointed out in my sentencing memo, this was a no win case. Well, I mean, when we walked in the door, there's, there are no winners here. Every single person just one to here. And there's also no limit on the amount of sadness, grief, and horrific emotions that are felt across the board in this case. And when Ms. Mrs. Crumbly does express remorse, um, I'm sorry, when she expresses sadness, there's a tendency, and there has been a tendency, for people to say she's shifting from sadness to the victims and putting it on herself. She's not doing that. There's an abundance of sadness. There's enough sadness to go around for all of the victims, for Mrs. Crumbly, for, for everyone involved in this case. It's not surprising that the victims have come in and obviously want the maximum sentence. There has been a narrative throughout this case that they, they believe is true. And this court knows that there is other information that was not a part of this case. And I believe this court knows the defense was hugely hamstrung, and I think the court was pained at times <coughs> over what to do. Um, I guess I'm not sure you I'm talking about not being able to call the medical professionals. Um, not being able to call the shooter to the stand, not being able to cross-examine on various pieces of evidence. I'm, I'm not the, convinced the shooter would have helped you. Okay, those, well, all of those are going to be, are obviously issues, but there were things that came from the defense. And I do believe... the forensic records? I do believe the shooter would have helped, and I do believe the forensic records would have helped. Um, and I, I understand the court has already ruled on that. I, I understand that. 
I think the tendency, though, after hearing the narrative that has been made public, has been to make Jennifer Crumbly sound like a monster, to vilify her, to make her sound like a horrible mother, an evil person. And the truth is, it's an effort to put her in a category of other, to say this is not something that could happen to any of us. And it is. It is something that could happen to any of us. And people fail to realize what the sentencing memo shows the court through numerous letters of support that Mrs. Crumbly does have a kind heart. She does have compassion. She has spent night after night crying, not for only herself and her son, but also for the victims and for what her son did and what she will live with knowing he did and what she missed all the years forward. We, at the end of the day, we asked the court to look at Mrs. Crumley's role in the offenses. We asked the court to consider that while she did not oppose having a gun in the home, she was not the person who was responsible for storing the gun and believed it was being stored properly and that it was locked. Mrs. Crumbly obviously testified, and all of the evidence at trial showed she believed there was a, a string lock, a cable lock, placed on the gun, on the weapon. Yeah, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but that, that has really troubled me um, from, from your sentencing memo because you spent a lot of time talking about the fact that she didn't know anything about the gun, um, she didn't lock it, she wasn't responsible for it. but. At one time, she was texting her husband to see whether or not he got the gun and how much it was. She posted pictures of it as her son's Christmas present. She shot the gun. And I don't know if you're aware of this. I don't know if either side was aware of this, but the first jury determined um, that there was a claim that the gun was the responsibility solely of defendant James Cromley. And Mrs. Crumley testified that when she returned from the range of the shooter on November 27th, it was the defendant, James Crumley, who was responsible for the six hour and retrieved it from the car and was supposed to keep it safe. Um, the first jury recognized that the GPS admitted in the case shows that even prior to the defendant, James Crumley, returning to the house, the shooter was videotaping the unlocked six hour in the kitchen of the home. So, that, that's not true. That's not true. She also testified that a key to the cable lock was kept in the beer stein in the kitchen, but it's clear that the cable lock was clearly never opened. Your Honor, the first of all, I the jury's finding about the timing of the GPS and when the gun video was made is not correct. The evidence at trial did not support that. We know that's not correct. Mrs. Crumbly left the gun in the car so that James Crumley could put the gun in the house and store it correctly. Mrs. Crumley, there were multiple cable locks in that house because there were, um, there, there was more than one cable lock. There was not just the cable lock that was on the Sig Sauer. There was, there was more than one. I didn't call him. I, there were not more than one found, but whatever Ethan Crumley did with the cable lock from the Sig Sauer, we, we don't know. Good was it? Your Honor, jury, okay, factually, during Mrs. Crumbly's trial, it was not proven that the gun was not locked. I don't know what happened at James's trial, James Crumbly's trial. You know about his statements? The gun was never locked. Whose statements? Mr. Crumbly's statements. Mr. Mr. Crumley and Mrs. Crumley talked about how the gun had been locked in, in all of the evidence I saw. Well, Your Honor, obviously go, we have go on, go on, go on, go on. <coughs> I don't think the evidence has shown that she had no involvement with the gun. I, and I'm not saying no involvement. I, I said she supported the gun. She didn't object to the gun. But when it came down to it, probation rights in her narrative that she taught her son how to use the gun, and it's very obvious watching the evidence in the trial that she was not the one teaching him how to use there, the gun. There's no evidence that you talked about this. 
he, when Mrs. Crumbly spoke, she um, acknowledged what the testimony was the trial about all of the different things that she wished had come to her attention from the school employees. And the prosecutor's office has said that the proposal the defense has made regarding Mrs. Crumbly is a slap in the face. And what's truly a slap in the face, not only to the victims in this case, but also to the Crumblies, is how much the Oxford schools did fail the Crumblies and all the victims. Because if Mrs. Crumbly had been presented <coughs> any of those five things, things would be different and we, we would probably not be here today. Um, I am asking this court, I know the court of public opinion is running high right now. Emotions are running very high. There are many, many complicated issues with this case. It is, it is a dynamic and different case than most cases. Mrs. Crumbly does have a good heart. This is a woman who had no felony history. This is a working mom who was, was very busy, did have a hobby. Um, I did I And I'm, I'm just saying, largely the evidence at trial was, were some of those things. And um, Mrs. Crumbly did have an enormous amount of love for her son. And what she has painted out, been painted out to be in the media and throughout this case, and even throughout the victim impact statements today, is just not congruent with the people who know Mrs. Crumbly and know her heart. It's also not congruent with the text messages she sent right after the shooting about how she wished she would have died instead of one of the kids. I, I don't think the verdict was about how feeling she is or how sad she is. I, I think the verdict was about behaviors that led up to that day. Well, there has been an enormous amount of criticism about whether or not she's sad enough, and there was cross-examination extensively about whether she cried or not enough on the stand, or, or when during the videos that were played of police uh, interviews and things like that. And then, <coughs> on the same hand, I, when I don't doubt that they were both in shock. They were down there. And at the end of the day, though, when she did cry, there was an objection about crying. And so Mrs. Crumbly from the very beginning has been damned no matter what way she went. This was the most horrific thing that could have happened to the community, to the victims, to these families. Absolutely horrific. At the end of the day, however, it's, it's a unique and complicated case, and that is why I proposed the sentence I did. I don't believe the sentencing guidelines <coughs> take into account the very unique situation that we have in this case with a young man who will be in prison forever. I'm asking the court to keep that in mind, and please keep in mind the other arguments throughout the memo. Uh, I think you know that I, I read everything you send me. I do, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Do you want to respond now, or do you want to put my counter from the sign of yours? Um, I prefer just to be able to respond once, Your Honor. Are you OK with that? That's fine, Your Honor. Uh, would you like to address the court, or would you like to call the court, please? Would you like to address the court? Yes, yeah, sir. Mr. Crumbly will address the court. Um, for the record, he does have something typed out that I typed out for him, so it's bigger, it's easier for him to read. Your honor. Okay. <coughs> you no, she said she cannot tell him to. Let's. let's oh. him. He would. Your honor, there was some confusion about whether or not he could get his second handcuff off. I was just clarifying. The court said she cannot tell oh, the sheriff. Sure. Does he have to keep holding the handcuff? Yes. Sir. I was just clarifying, Your Honor. Thank you. Before I address this court directly, I want to do something that I have never been able to do throughout this time until now. I want to say I can't imagine the pain and agony that the families, for the families that have lost their children and what they're experiencing and what they're going through. As a parent, our biggest fear is losing our child or our children. And to lose a child is unimaginable. I. My, my heart is really broken 
for everybody involved. I understand my words are not going to bring any comfort. I understand that they're not going to relieve any pain. And quite frankly, they probably just don't believe me. However, I really want the families of Madison Baldwin, Hannah St. Juliana, Tate Meyer, Mir, and Justin Schilling to know how truly am I, how truly sorry I am and how devastated I was when I heard what happened to them. I have cried for you and the loss of your children more times than I can count. I know your pain and loss will never go away. Part of you will be missing forever. But please know that I am truly very sorry. I am sorry for your loss as a result of what my son did. I cannot express how much I wish that I had known what was going on with him or what was going to happen because I absolutely would have done a lot of things differently. Again, my, my heart pours out to every single one of you. It really does. Just Matthews, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna overdo a, a, a lot of things that, that, that were already said. But I know the full amount of pressure that that you have on you and the responsibility that has been placed on you throughout this case. I have the utmost respect for you, and I'm simply going to ask that you sentence me in a fair and just way. You presided over my trial and heard the evidence that was presented against me. You know that what my son did I was not aware of, or that he was planning it, or that he obtained access to the firearms in my house. There was absolutely no evidence that suggested that. As my attorney has told you, I've been on lockdown for 23 hours a day. I've not been able to speak to my son since November 30th, and I have not been able to speak with my wife since December 3rd. I know that I have experienced pales in compassion to what those families who have lost their children and countless other victims experience every day because of what my son did. But I want you to know I too grieve for everyone as I have explained for everyone that's been affected by what my son pled guilty to doing. And I'll continue to feel this pain for the rest of my life as well. If I could go back and change things, if I could go back and do things differently, and maybe none of us would be here today. So again, I ask your honor to impose a just and fair sentence based on the truth about what you heard during my trial. I'm asking the court to sentence me to time served and place me on probation for the maximum time allowed with the GPS tether for as long as the court deems necessary. I also want to address one last thing. And that's to what Tate Mears 
dad said, it is time that we all know the truth. We have been prohibited from telling the whole truth. The whole truth has not been told. And I'm with you, Mr. Mir. I too want the truth. Because you have not had it. You have not had the truth at all. The truth has not been presented to you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. I did submit a sentencing memorandum, Your Honor. I'm not going to belabor the points that I made in my memorandum, as I do believe that it was thorough. However, I do want to note for the court that, especially in statements that have been made about James, that he lacks remorse, that he doesn't feel bad, that he's trying to put off responsibility on everyone but himself. Um, that he's allegedly made threats for the, the elected prosecutor. Your Honor, in some of the same calls that the prosecution has tried to use and has quoted in their own sentencing memorandum and attached as exhibits to their memorandum, as I noted in my, in my sentencing memorandum, Your Honor, James also said in those very same calls that he wished that he had known what his son <coughs> was capable of. That if he had known, if he had been made aware of these things, if he had known that his son had, had obtained access to a firearm, that maybe he could have saved the, the four children's lives. That maybe he could have saved a lot more than that. Your Honor, there has never been a time that James Crumbly has not acknowledged what happened in this case. He has felt horrific grief for not only the families, but for the people who have been affected He's grieved for himself, for his own child. And while that may not be something that, that is a popular statement to make, he's grieved for the, the child that he believed he had. <coughs> not the child who pled guilty, but the child that he believed he had on the morning of November 30th when he dropped his son off at school. James could not have predicted what his son was going to do that day. He couldn't have predicted because he didn't know that it was going to happen. As James said, Your Honor, you sat through the trial, Judge. You heard the evidence that was presented. You also know that there was no indication given in the evidence presented that James had knowledge of what his son was planning. That James didn't know that his son had been accessing that firearm unsupervised. Or that he had access to the firearm unsupervised. Judge, you heard that that firearm was stored legally at the, the laws at the time, in November of 2021 that there may be differing opinions on whether or not that firearm was stored responsibly, Your Honor, but it was stored legally. It was stored unloaded. It was stored with the ammunition stored separately. Your Honor, James Crumley did and made the decisions that he thought were right. Based on the information that he had, even on the morning of November 30th at the school, you've heard multiple times that James had no, had no knowledge of what his son was intending to do later that day. That even the school officials, the people who were trained, they, they talked about the special training that they had during trial. Even those individuals said that they did not believe that James's son was a threat to other people. That they had concerns about his sadness, Your Honor. They had, they had at a minimum concerns about his danger to himself, right? Correct, Your Honor. Danger to himself due to his level of sadness. That they wanted him to go talk with somebody, but that it wasn't so emergent that he needed to be removed immediately. And isn't it the reason they didn't want him to go home? Your Honor, there's some dispute as to whether or not the testimony from the school is accurate as to what actually occurred in that office. And, and Judge, I, I don't want to try and retry the case. Um, I don't think it serves anyone or benefits anyone. Um, but I do want this court to be aware, and, and Your Honor, you observed James during the trial. You're aware that he had difficult, that there was, he had difficulties throughout the trial. He showed emotion. He struggled with some of the things that he heard and saw. And I don't, I don't know how anyone could have. 
I agree, Your Honor. I agree. And as I've acknowledged numerous times throughout this case and throughout the trial, it is an incredibly emotional trial. Today is incredibly emotional for everyone involved. I echo what Ms. Smith said. There are no winners here. Everyone has lost in this case. I think that Ms. Smith said in her sentencing memo that it's possible it didn't stand for everyone here, not just the victims, but their families as well. It is possible it didn't stand for everyone. And I agree with that, Your Honor. I did ask the court to sentence James to time served. I am going to echo his request for a period of supervision with a GPS tether. I understand that the court reached a consensus in scoring. I understand that, again, the court has significantly strong pressure. The emotions run high in this case, Your Honor. I don't envy what you have to do. However, I am asking that you consider my request. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Your Honor, I just have to correct some facts. The allegations that Ms. Jennifer and James Crumpley were left in the dark just are not true. And the evidence at trial does not show that. The evidence presented at trial that as late back as March the 9th, 17th, and the 20th, text messages from their son to Jennifer Crumpley that he was seeing things. In April, his text messages to his friends indicate he asked for help. His mother laughed at him. April 20th, Jennifer told his friend's mother that he was depressed. There were multiple visits to the gun range. There was two guns purchased for him. The Crumpleys were aware that he was struggling in school. And, in fact, they had a rather, I would say, critical fight the night before, which is all detailed, incidentally, as well as where the gun actually was. In the shooter's statements, his plea, and the multiple statements he made to the psychiatrist, the very same things, they stand here and say, if only we could have called them. Well, calling those individuals would have resulted in all of the claims that's inconsistent with what he said, and it's inconsistent with what the psychiatrist testified to in the Miller hearing. So I had no intention of addressing this, but it was brought up, so I feel as if I have to, and I have a duty to do so. They were concerned. The evidence showed that. They were very concerned. They were concerned about the drawing, and they were concerned based on the fact that they were called to school. Jennifer Crumley's own statements, own statements, acknowledges she was called to the school. They wanted him to get help. She said she had to go back to work, but they said that he could stay. None of that, by the way, is in dispute, and that she left. This insinuation that if only I had known he was sleeping in class and teachers might have been concerned, that none of this would have happened, is at the core of why you saw six people standing here and saying there's no remorse or accountability. And I want to be clear, remorse does not sound like I feel really bad. I'm sure they do. I don't dispute they feel bad. I don't dispute they have grief. That's not the kind of remorse and accountability these victims are looking for. What that looks like is we messed up. We should have done this, and we didn't, and we are very sorry. And that has not happened, which is what we're talking about here and what you heard the victims say. I don't want to belabor any more than we had to in the trial. I have a deep respect for Ms. Lehman, but the facts of this and the elements of this case simply are not that the prosecution had to show that he had actual knowledge and he could predict and he knew exactly what his son was going to do. Those are not the elements of the crime. It's not what the jury was required to find, and it has nothing to do with their actual conviction. Jennifer Crumley and James Crumley were not convicted based on a narrative. They were not convicted because somebody thought they were a bad or good parent. Those two trials involved multiple, multiple motions and objections over evidence that the court sustained. We did not allow the jury to present 
the, the information about Jennifer Crumbly that her lawyer made a strategic decision to, in the middle of the trial, say, open the door, you can bring it all in, was not, was not due to the prosecution's request for actions. But you can't seek to exclude evidence and then allow somebody to testify to an inconsistent with the evidence. The last thing I want to say is there is case law that the court's aware of about what the court can consider in, in fashioning a proportional sentence. And we don't give power or authority to victims to decide or render verdicts with good reason. But we should not and we cannot sanitize their pain or the weight of the impact or chalk it up to it's emotionally charged. As if everything that's happened here is because people <coughs> sit, sit, sitting here are too emotional and they pressure people. Because that just simply isn't true. And not only should you consider the weight and the impact of the defendant's actions and inactions, you are required to, pursuant to the case law. It is one of the factors to consider, the severity and the impact of the crime. We, we've, we've heard a lot about it's not what happened in the school. And while I understand that the, the, the negligence, the gross negligence that occurred happened before what happened in that day when he left that bathroom and started firing the nine millimeter and killing four kids. I understand that. But it is absolutely about what James and Jennifer did and what they didn't do and the gross negligence that caused those acts. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like. When two parents have the ability and are in the best position and have the most knowledge and need to protect other kids and they do nothing. This is what it looks like. They do nothing and then they come here today and they claim they're victims of the school, of the prosecution, of the emotional tensions of public opinion. But there were two long and rigorous and detailed trials that included multiple victims and witnesses who testified under oath with hundreds of exhibits presented to the juries with the safeguard of this court allowing what they could see and what they couldn't see and they were defended by two attorneys aptly and vigorously that is what this conviction is about and when fashioning a sentence it is absolutely critical that you, that you listen and consider the impact of what that gross negligence caused. So we're asking you to exceed the guidelines because I believe all of the factors pursuant to the case law with the necessary consideration of the impact of these crimes justifies you to do. We're asking you, the people are asking you, Your Honor, to consider the devastating impact of their gross negligence that was foreseeable. Help me. Blood everywhere. The world is dead. All the while, a 9mm had just been purchased for him and, and he, 50 rounds of ammunition. Both things can be true, Your Honor. You can fashion a proportionate sentence but not ignore the unimaginable loss and a grief that these parents, these parents are enduring. Because they will never get back another moment with Tate or Hannah or Justin or Madison. And this is what it looks like. Thank you. Thank you. I guess I would like to say briefly to the families, um, considering your
immeasurable grief that's completely understandable to hate everything associated with these proceedings. I um, spent both trials looking out at all the family members, and I, I wonder to myself, I was looking straight on at Mr. S uh, St. Juliano, whether or not he'll ever smile again. And um, that's very difficult. Um, I'm very aware uh, of my job in the situation, very aware of my job uh, to not be uh, swayed uh, by public opinion, by media, by any of those different things. I can't and um, will not pretend to understand the pain the families are experiencing, but I did sit through these trials with you. I saw what you saw. I heard what you heard. So I can and will offer my deepest and most sincere condolences for your unfathomable, well, unfathomable losses. It's, it's, as I just said, it's not, it's not my role, it's not the role of the court system to make an example of the defendants. However, it is a goal of sentencing to act as a deterrent. These charges are not jury edicts about gun ownership or keeping a gun in a private home. All of the jurors in both trials agreed that they understood that. Parenting is a complex job. Parenting practices around the world share the goals of ensuring health and safety, preparation for life as a productive adult, and transmission of cultural values. Parents are not expected to be psychic. But these convictions are not about poor parenting. These convictions confirm repeated acts or lack of acts that could have halted an oncoming runaway train, about repeatedly ignoring things that would make a reasonable person feel the hair on the back of their neck stand up, opportunity knocked over and over again, louder and louder, and was ignored. No, one's, no one answered, and these two people should have and sure didn't. Mr. Crumley, it's clear to this court that because of you, there was unfettered access to a gun or guns, as well as ammunition in your home. You characterized yourself as a martyr and threatened the well-being of the prosecutor. Mrs. Crumley, you glorified the use and possession of these weapons. Your attitude toward your son and his behaviors was dispassionate and apathetic. Your response to school staff after a 12-minute meeting was, are we done here? During your trial, you announced that you wouldn't do anything different. I understand that that might have been uh, misinterpreted, but it did cut the victims deep. Because of both of your actions and inaction, among many, many other things, the world is missing out on a top uh, the world is missing out on, and a top college university will meet out, meet, miss, miss out on Tate's star quality football skills. Um, I, I met Raina, who's wise beyond her years, and she's told us that among many, many other things, the community will be denied Hannah's kindness, creativity, and sense of humor. Among many, many other things, the world will miss is Madison's kind and loving soul and the light that reflected her beauty both inside and out. Although a hero in death because of his organ donations that helps so many, we will never know where Justin, an excellent student with vast skills and interests, described as a mentor and a leader, would have left his giant imprint. The impact statements given here and the written statements provided to the court describe the cataclysmic impact the deaths of these children have had on their children. With regard uh, to each defendant, um, this court uh, has spent night and day thinking about this case, as you can imagine. I prayed about this case, I thought about this case, and I've considered the possibility for rehabilitation, the need to protect society, the penalty appropriate to the conduct and goal of deterring others from similar, similar conduct. I, re I have reviewed the pre-sentence investigation reports. I am, of course, sadly familiar with the facts and circumstances of these cases, as well as those surrounding each defendant. 
The advisory sentencing guidelines in this matter do not capture the catastrophic impact of the acts or inaction in, the, in these matters. The guidelines do not take into account the complete lack of insight both defendants have for their behavior to this very day. The guidelines do not account for the severe, severity of the circumstances in this matter. The guidelines ignore the survivors, including shooting victims, Phoebe Arthur, Elijah Mueller, Riley Franz, Kylie Osage, John Asciutto, Molly Darnell, and Aiden Watson. They were deeply wounded, both physically and emotionally. In addition to the seven wounded, each of the defendants' gross negligence has caused unimaginable suffering to hundreds of others as a result of what happened that day. Each act or inaction created a ripple effect. Therefore, an out-of-guidelines sentence is appropriate and proportional. The court uses the useful, useful tool of the legislative guidelines, which embody the, the principles of proportionality, while also taking into account the nature of the offense and the background of each defendant. I believe that the following sentences would be in the best interest of justice and are reasonable and proportionate to the seriousness of the matter and the circumstances surrounding each defendant. With regard to Jennifer Crumley, it is the sentence of this court, Ms. Crumley, that you served 10 to 15 years with the Michigan Department of Corrections. You will have credit for 858 days. State costs are $272. as a crime victim's rights fee of $130. Um, you and your agents may not have any contact with fam the families of Madison Baldwin, Tate Meir, Hannah St. Juliana, and Justin Schilling. Um, I will issue another ruling with regard to contact um, with your son, the shooter. <coughs> Excuse me. As, defend as to defendant James Crumley, it is the sentence of this court that you served 10 to 15 years with the Michigan Dep Department of Corrections that you receive credit for 858 days, that you pay state costs in the matter of uh, $272, that there is a crime victim's rights fee of $130, that you or your agents have no contact with the families of Madison Baldwin, Tate Muir, Hannah St. Saint Juliana, and uh, Justin Schilling. Um, Ms. Wheeler, have I left anything out with regard to sentencing? No restitution has been um, requested by any of the families at this time, correct? That's correct. Thank you. Um, I would like to advise both defendants that you are entitled to appellate review of your conviction and sentence, including that the sentence exceed, exceeds the guideline range. This is done by filing a claim of appeal by right, or when, you're, or when you are not entitled to file a claim of appeal by right, an application for leave to appeal. If you cannot afford to hire an attorney to represent you on appeal, and you request an attorney, an attorney may be appointed for you. You may request an attorney by completing the request for appointment of attorney section of the form that will be provided for you and by returning the form to this court or to the Michigan Assigned Counsel System at the address on the form. If you wish to preserve your automatic right to appeal, the form must be received within 42 days after sentencing. If you do not submit the form within 42 days from today, you may still file an application for leave to appeal if the form is received within six months after sentencing. Um, do each of the defendants acknowledge receipt of their appellate rights? James acknowledges receipt, Your Honor, he's completing the form as we speak. Your Honor, my plan is as well. Does the, would the court like the forms here, or would you prefer us to? It, it doesn't matter either way. Okay. Either way. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask that everyone remain seated while the defendants are taken out of the courtroom. Um, I think we're going to uh, finish their assault. They are going to, Mr. Crumley is going to fill us his, finish his part. All right. We'll, we'll wait for that. Thank you, Your Honor. I would just ask that no one, no one stand up. It makes the deputies nervous.
Well, you just heard the historic sentencing of James and Jennifer Crumbly, the first parents in America to be convicted of involuntary manslaughter for the actions of their child in a school shooting. 10 to 15 years was the sentence handed down by the judge. Very clear that Judge Cheryl Matthews has done extensive research. She said she's thought about this case. She's prayed about this case. She mentioned earlier in the hearing today that she has been researching the guidelines, this sentence above the guidelines. Mm -hmm. But what many of all of the parents asked for was give them the max. And that's what she appears to have done. And in line with what the prosecutors asked for, the prosecutors were asking for 10 years more. The defense was asking for either time served or uh, to actually be allowed to serve out that sentence in the guest house of the of her attorney that was a Jennifer Crumbly that would be a, quite an unusual uh, grant if it were granted but that of course not what the judge uh, decided she decided 10 to 15 years for both parents they will get credit for more than 800 days served behind bars now let's bring in a legal analyst Todd flood former prosecutor here uh, Todd these are historic uh, sentences we now know what the judge's ruling is 10 to 15 years for the parents what are your thoughts on this are you surprised that she chose to go above the guidelines in this case no, actually, I'm not. And uh, I think there was more than substantial and compelling reasons to do so based on the record and the uh, uniqueness of, and ugliness of this case and the victims of, for which they have suffered. What is <clears throat> obvious and clear, I think, to everybody is how prepared Judge Matthews was with this case. She was citing facts um, and basically telling the attorneys, um, in, in particular, the defense attorneys, when they objected to specific facts, uh, Cheryl Matthews, Judge Matthews, corrected them and, and showed them uh, specific sections for what she was uh, basically gleaning from. So she gave a lot of thought in this, um, but we have said it before. We've talked about it before, Judge Kenny and myself, with all of you, that uh, this uniqueness of this case is one where it wouldn't surprise us that uh, there's a compelling reason to go over uh, the guidelines. And the maximum she could give was that of two-thirds of the 15-year statute. So that two-thirds is 10 to 15. What that really means is, is the first time they have the opportunity to serve parole or uh, look at parole, it will be that time. And so we know that that 10 to 15 years is when they'll be behind bars. Now, the judge mentioned the potential for rehabilitation, safety of the community, and the pre-sentencing guidelines. Are those the factors uh, that you would expect her to look at uh, when she's making this type of sentencing? All of those factors come into play. Those are equitable factors that you look at. Uh, deterrence, uh, rehabilitation, the likelihood of threats, what happened during their time of being locked up. Uh, those are obvious factors that the court looks at. And then the the next thing that we, we look at is disparity in treatments, you know, compared to other cases. Um, there isn't a case where uh, a mass shooting has taken place and involuntary manslaughter was charged to that of the parents. So I, I think when you when you look at the um, the impact that this has had for their dereliction of duty, their their failure to act and their overt acts, um, I, I think there is uh, more than enough um, uh, to show the the necessary elements of going up upwards to a higher sense over the advisory guidelines. Again, the guidelines are just kind of a barometer for a court to look at nowadays. Uh, the judge has the robe. The judge is going to make that decision, and it's not kind of a rubber stamp, if you will. Uh, at one time it was, but no longer. And so by that not being a rubber stamp like it might have been in the past, going above the guidelines does not in and of itself present grounds for an appeal. No, no. I mean, there are grounds for an appeal if they're disproportionate um, and they didn't lay out the factors necessary to get to uh, above the sentencing guidelines. Um, but now in this case, everything was laid out perfectly, and, and you could see that the court um, really nailed 
the the facts down of why she sentenced the person uh, the defendants the way she did so uh, although albeit advisory um there can be cases where there is reasons to appeal a sentencing obviously the shooter's case right but um here um there there isn't i don't think any appellate rule uh that was vile you know any appellate grounds to to basically send this back because it was improper sentencing the sentencing in and of itself i think uh, is appropriate and the judge laid out all the factors all right uh todd flood a former wayne county prosecutor current managing partner of a flood law firm todd thank you so much for your time and your insight really do appreciate it thanks for having me all right let's go now to sarah michaels who's live just outside the courtroom sarah yeah, you guys, we are just outside the courtroom. People have been walking out. We've been seeing some people walking out with tears running down their face. The victim impact statements that we heard in court today, I can't emphasize this enough, were absolutely heartbreaking. We did hear from the family of Madison Baldwin, and we have the attorney for the family here with us right now. Um, you know, the last couple of months, we've had the privilege of speaking with these family members, and they've said to us that they felt that they didn't see any remorse from James and Jennifer Crumbly. It appeared today in court that they attempted to show some of that remorse today. Do you think that that was successful? No, I thought, frankly, it was very shallow, uh, especially, especially Mrs. Crumbly, who tried to deflect everything on her son. You should blame her son still, her son and the school district and everybody else and not taking accountability for her own actions and her husband's actions. Same with him. We heard from multiple parents who gave them their victim impact statements saying that we're not getting the full truth, um, seemingly referencing the school. James Crumbly talked today, one of the first times we've been able to hear from him, and he looked to the parents and said, I want to hear the truth too. I haven't heard that either. The judge did not seem to agree with that, um, neither did the prosecutor. What did you think about that? I think Mr. Amir and Mr. Crumbly are dead on. We haven't heard the complete truth. We haven't gotten complete justice. We've gotten two-thirds of the measures of justice, but They're the school district again. and its administrators and employees have to be held accountable for what they did. I mean, speaking just to that, Mr. Schilling and Mr. Amir as well, in the last couple of days, they have told us that this is just the beginning and that we're going to be seeing a lot more regarding the lawsuit for Oxford Public Schools. What can you share with us about that? We will, after the appellate process, hopefully we'll be back getting discovery and, and putting these folks under oath for the first time to address the questions that the parents want answered, not that the prosecution is looking for, that the parents want. Absolutely. And we did hear from some of those parents during the victim impact statements today talking about they have had to be in this courthouse so many times delivering different impact statements, rehashing all of this tragedy and trauma. Um, from Madison Baldwin's family, were you able to have a discussion about having to get another statement, having to talk to the parents in the court one more time? Did it bring any closure or is it just more difficult every time they have to do this? I think on behalf of Madison's mom and the other families, it it is continuing to be difficult. You have to relive this. It's gut-wrenching. And you heard Nicole's statement. It couldn't have been more powerful and more heartfelt. Uh, but it's gut-wrenching to hear and imagine having to deliver it in a courtroom full of people when you're, that's not who they are. They're just normal, private folks. Nicole gave that first victim impact statement today. Um, and it was, it was hard not to tear up when you were listening to her. She talked about how the day of the shooting, what James and Jennifer were gro going through, and then the juxtaposition to what she was going through, detailing, trying to find out what hospital her daughter was in. It's hard to talk about now. Um, it's really emotional hearing from her. It was emotional to listen to it. I was in tears. Mm -hmm. When you talk about exactly the juxtaposition of what the f parents were doing and the complete opposite of how it was felt, with being a true victim, not the victims that, that the Crumblies portray themselves to be. But it was just, that's just gut-wrenching. Multiple parents the last couple of weeks have told us personally how disappointed and how upset they are. I think actually that Madison Baldwin's family called it 
disgusting how Jennifer Crumbly said that she wouldn't do anything differently if she could go back. Interestingly, today it seemed as though she tried to backtrack on that and say that people misunderstood her during her trial. Do you think that she was misunderstood during her trial? No, I think what came out on video under oath was exactly what she felt at the time and only in retrospect that it's gotten such backlash as she tried to backtrack. That was who she was. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You. We really appreciate Thank it. Mm -hmm. There are still some parents who are inside of the courtroom right now. Um, in addition to the parents of the victims, we also heard from Hannah St. Juliana's older sister. That was extremely powerful testimony. She looked James and Jennifer Crumbly in the eye and she said that you are responsible for buying the bullets and providing the gun that killed my sister. She talked about how it's hard for her to even find happiness ever since then because her sister was happiness. We heard from the other parents saying that it's hard for them to sleep at night. It's hard for them to handle their emotions. That people say that time heals all, but it has not healed anything for them. Like I said, a few more of those family members are still inside the courthouse. We're going to stay here hoping to hear from them once again, but just an extremely emotional day here in court, you guys. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Yes, it was absolutely gut-wrenching listening to the parents today we obviously we've we've heard them before they've had to do this multiple times and they did they address that trauma of having to do this over and over again but you know Craig Schilling saying time heals all wounds but no these wounds are still as fresh as November 30th this, it is not getting better for them if anything it's probably getting harder but parent after parent sibling after sibling uh, just saying this this was the they ruined their lives. Without a doubt. I think each person, there was both a commonality in their heartbreak and their pain, but each person described it differently. The loss, of course, we know is going to be so individualized because what their child meant to them was so personal. But they laid it all out there in court. It was raw and it was emotional. Let's bring back uh, Todd Flood into our conversation. And Todd, we heard these uh, parents and we heard these siblings of those lost in the shooting uh, describe their loss. What is the role of these impact statements and do they really make a difference? Because we know the judge heard the statements and then issued her ruling. Did they have any, any role in changing what happened in that courtroom today? Well, I can tell you, if you didn't have a, uh, a tear in your eye or if you weren't crying uh, over this, I don't know what would make you cry. Uh, the impact um, that these statements had, these victims had on the judge, I think um, basically solidified in her mind where she was going with this sentence. Um, I've had cases where, you know, you know the a victim would ask for mercy on the uh, defendant, and, and that may have had an impact. But in this particular case, I think it just solidified exactly where the court was going. Um, think of the massive amount of heartache and the visceral wounds that these families will have to live with for the rest of their lives in Oxford in and of itself. So I, candidly, this is... Um, I think a day that a sentencing over the guideline sentence is so appropriate based on what this has done um, uh, to these families. And forget about deterrence, forget about all the other things that may come into the equation when you think about sentencing. This is one where the damage uh, clearly to the individual families and to the impact of Oxford is one which um, you've changed the trajectory of everyone. You've changed the trajectory of, of, of hundreds of lives and um, things we'll never see from these beautiful kids that are now now with us. Now, we heard uh, the families make their statement. We also heard James and Jennifer Crumbly uh, speak to the court as well. Jennifer said they were good parents. She did say that this uh, changed her. She apologized. Did that make any difference here? Could, is there anything she could have said or that James could have said to make a difference here? Um, you know, it's it's the ability um, or the impact of being and telling your story um, as a defendant or as the attorney 
as an advocate for the defendant to tell that story of this person, uh, where they come from, uh, how they were raised, uh, their education level, those types of things. I doubt very seriously based on all of the actions that uh, they showed and all of the, the mountain of evidence that was presented uh, that anything would have changed the, the outcome in this sentence. But we don't know what we don't know. Uh, I, you know, I think candidly their statements, um, J uh, James Crumbly, um, I think was more powerful than Jennifer, but, um, the, the fact of the matter is, is that, um, you, you have to step up to the plate and you have to take your, your time. And, uh, I think he, um, put that out there to the extent that he could, but there was nothing really that was going to change the judge's mind. All right. Uh, Todd Flood, uh, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Uh, it has been invaluable as we have moved throughout this case since that uh, terrible day back in November of 2021. Once again, James and Jennifer Crumbly sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison for the involuntary manslaughter convictions, the murder of the four children inside Oxford High School. We must remember their names. Tate Meir, Hannah St. Juliana, Madison Baldwin, and Justin Schilling. We'll have more online at WXYZ.com. All right. And on later editions of 7 Action News. Thank you so much for, for joining us. We'll have more coverage throughout the day. This has been a breaking news alert. We now return you to our regularly scheduled program, Already in Progress.